Hey, welcome to Order 42. I am Rob, and today we've got a couple of special guests. So, uh, so why don't we just bring him in? How about that? So, that's the wrong button. Here we go. We've got Jose Marin. Is is it Marin or Marin? I'd actually don't know. Uh, Marin or Marin, either one. Marin. Okay. Yeah. And then Yoshi Vu. He's he's been here many many times. Um. So welcome, guys. How are you guys doing? Hey, thank you very much. Yeah, and, happy to be here. And I lo- and Yoshi, I love your background there. That's that's a for a visual visual effects guy. I mean, your background is just insane. Your Zoom background, just killing the Zoom game. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So yeah, Yoshi. Yeah, Yoshi is uh, in an undisclosed location doing undisclosed things. I, I can say I'm in Bel Air, but that's it. There you go. Yeah, but he's he's doing he's doing some work today. So he may yeah. not be able to stick around too long, but. Uh, but that's that's okay, that's okay. But, uh, oh, but yeah, this neighborhood is a swanky neighborhood. Yeah, it, it definitely looks like it. Definitely looks like it. Just, just so you know. <laughs> what was that? I said I don't live here. Just so you know. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everybody, just chill out. Everything's everything's good. But so let me let me uh, let me just ask the 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 question because I, I since I've got the two of you here. How did you guys meet? How did you guys, I mean, would you guys work together? Like what, what's the, what's the story there? Uh, yeah. Um, I think initially we met out in Baton Rouge in Louisiana. Uh, we were both out there working for a company called Fixamondo. And uh, at the time, I don't know if we were on the same project, same time or not, but uh, we were in completely different departments. Um, <clears throat> at a certain point uh, out there, we didn't really have an internal like IMing program. So we're all just using our like our Skype account. And that was just kind of the thing. All right, hey, go ahead and find everybody that's on the team and add each other. And it was kind of, uh, you know, just kind of figuring out as we went along. Um, so at this point, Yoshi, I don't know how long you had been there, but um, we had uh, we had just gotten there. And really, all it really took was I saw on the, uh, the Skype image, I noticed that he had a Kevlar helmet on. And um, I was like, oh, no kidding. I was like, this is, a, this is one of the guys that's here in, in Baton Rouge. So uh, I, was, I was like, hey, you know, I, uh, I didn't realize uh, you're a veteran. I just wanted to reach out and, uh, and just kind of talk. And I didn't know him, had no clue what his personality was like or anything like this. And I was very, very, uh, I wouldn't say like new uh, in the field, but relative to, to like kind of where, or like the time we put in now, um, definitely it was a kind of a kind of green and so I didn't know what to expect. And then I didn't hear from Yoshi for the rest of the day. And then like the next day and the next, I'm like, oh man, there's probably some important dude. And I was just like, hi, who are you? Blah, 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 this and that. And um, I remember like later, he just like, like, I think we just bumped into each other or something. And he's just like, oh, hey, what's up? Oh, I'm Yoshi, blah, blah, blah. And he like super friendly, introduced himself. And then later, I think, through this conversation, I was like, oh yeah, I was just like, I sent you the thing. He's like, oh my bad, I didn't see the thing. And he's like, I'm not really in it. You know, again, we're all kind of just starting to try to use Skype as a thing. So I was like, oh cool, he's not, he's not like, <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, I think really from there, it's been a hell of a story since then. That was, that was literally- we Started running one. together. Yeah, we started running the studio. Uh, literally running them around the lot, <laughs> like uh, trying to get everybody kind of um, uh, kind of build some camaraderie and uh, you know get some exercise and stuff like that. And, we try uh, to apply what we knew. <laughs> yeah, and it was it was great because like I think day one we had I want to say good like eighty percent of the studio with us, and then we were only doing it. I think it was like every other day, or we started with like Mondays. It wasn't it wasn't that far. It was like, like it was like that. not even a quarter mile. I think. Yeah, I think yeah, and then uh, it was around around the sound stages, and um, eventually I think we we figured it was a half a mile, and we're like, okay, oh, you know, we'll do a, a nice yeah, we'll do like a nice leisurely pace, whatever, and and we did have a lot of people who were very gung ho, and a lot of people who kind of it fit something that a goal that they were already shooting for, so you know it worked. But man, that eighty percent dropped off like the next week, and then by the, I think the end of the month, it was just like I think it was like me, Yoshi, and like two other people I, yeah, I like done it. <laughs> yeah like but, done it and like one other person and we're like all right well this is done yeah yeah he's a lead uh, lead uh, environment artist out in montreal um yeah. yeah great guy and yeah but at the same time he was just like that's the kind of thing he did anyways so yeah it was really well, it, it was really fun though 
Yeah, it was great because uh, if I remember correctly, I think Jose and I clicked pretty quickly. It's like after we initially broke through that, you know, that uh, broke the ice, as, as you say, and got to know each other. I think it was pretty much like chatting every day, going to have a beer. And then I think what really bonded us was Borderlands 2. <laughs> yeah. Once he found out I played Borderlands 2 on the Xbox and he did too, it was it became such a problem. Me and him would show up to work the next day tired because we were up to like 3 a.m. playing Borderlands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it was great because like if we could, um, you know, we'd try to get a couple of the friends and we'd have like the four person team. And it, it was so much fun, especially doing um, a lot of like the raid bosses and all that kind of stuff that is designed for that kind of a that, that kind of a group uh, situation and uh we really took it to its maximum i don't think that game ever got stale for us uh because we, we always figured out some other challenge to, to tackle or something else to do and now um you know life has kind of made it a little bit more difficult to enjoy some of the the, the more recent uh updates to the, the more uh, recent titles in the franchise but we're still making time somehow wherever we can you know here and there yeah yeah here and there yeah yeah see that's awesome i mean it's I don't know. Every story that you guys tell, it's like, yeah, I've got stories just like that, you know? And it's just like, yeah. it's, it's weird how like everywhere I've worked, I've had, I've made friends, you know, like lasting friends, lasting friendships for like years and years. And it's just one of those, I don't know. If, I don't know. Maybe I'm just one of those guys, you know, that yeah. just connects with people. But, um, no. so, so like, uh, how many different places have you guys worked together? Because it's been a few different places, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah officially, like real studios, I think three. Yeah. Like, like in, in location, it was a. Pick, uh, no, no, it was a. Uh, Pixelmon Pixel was Mondo. the first one. And, and then, then it was uh, All Things Media. Uh, all was things after media. That. And then Phosphine, right? Yeah, then Phosphine out in yeah. New York. Um, but we've worked on a ton of other projects that are just um, like. You know, more of a contract freelance, uh, helping um, either directors or other visual effects artists um, in, in indie projects and things like that. So everything from documentaries to YouTube to uh, you know feature films. Oh, yeah. he actually Jose helped me out with a few shots when I was falling behind on that DVD you got sitting on your shelf back there, Rob. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was you guys. This one? <laughs> yeah. Rob. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was that too. Yeah, I have that saved on there. I just, um, but... I've, I've just let. That's just there now. It just lives there. That's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. It's terrible, right? It's look. I enjoyed it from a um, almost a mystery science theater three thousand kind of kind of thing, but but it was like it's like <laughs> it's like God. The movie's almost over. When's Yoshi gonna show up? <laughs> and, then, and then he finally shows up, huh? Yeah. I had a I, I had a blast. I had a blast watching yeah. it, and then it was funny because I'm sitting there watching it and just kind of going, "What is this movie?" And <laughs> and April came in. Uh, my wife came in at the part where um, I can't remember the uh, <clears throat> the guy saying all of those like really kind of misogynistic things to the to the three women or the three. You know what I mean? Oh, Manu. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it, she was like, "I don't understand why you're Did watching this." Him? Do what? Should I go get them? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> is... no, they're, doing, they're doing movie stuff. But he is there, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. But yeah, I mean, um, it was I, like I said, I had a good time. I had a good time watching it. So, yeah, I would, yeah. if I you remember, there's a there's a bubble shield in the movie. You know, when they're standing on the desert, has that bubble shield? Yeah. And I remember the the director was like, "I want like a bubble shield, like Halo," and then I'm like, "Okay." So when he saw that, he's like, "That's perfect. How'd you do that?" I'm like, "That's the bubble shield from Halo." He's like, what, what do you mean? I'm like, I, I literally pulled it from the game <laughs> and just put it in because there you go. I didn't realize that. That's, that's, really that's pretty awesome. See, like, that, that's the cool stuff, too, is that, like, I mean, I'm sure there's probably, like, you might use an asset and kind of, like, change like change it up a little bit just to make it new. But yeah, I mean, when I say I pulled it from the game, I don't mean, like, I cut it out of the game and put it in. It was basically, like, I just pretty use much caught it one to like, one. Like you could use it as a like use it as a guide for your yeah as a guide yeah I pretty much yeah. use it as a guide like the way it moves the way it shines the way it dissipates and I'm like ah oh, I'll just do that. Gotcha, See, that's gotcha. awesome. I, yeah, I, I love cool. to be able to like recreate something, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's I don't know. I think that's awesome. But um, one of the other things that I wanted to since you both both are here, 
was uh, Motherless Brooklyn. I wanted to ask both of you guys about that because, because uh, you know, when I posted my review, you know, Yoshi was like, "Hey, we worked on that." Yeah, you know? yeah. So yeah, like, what was uh, like, what, what exactly did you guys do? Because I mean, I I love that movie. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I, I only came in for was it was it one week or two? I don't remember. But um, yeah, it, it was it was a it was a it was one of the two. But I think it was closer yeah, to whatever. Two I, weeks. I, I showed up and I was I was brought into the studio uh, phosphine for a week or two. And I was just there to help make the uh, Triborough Bridge. So that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, it I, was think so. I think he helped partially... some of the, the, the car paint shaders and stuff as well. Yeah, it, it was, the bridge was, the structure was already there. I think they just needed an artist to like fine tune it and make it film ready. So that's what I did. Because it was basically just, you know, simple geo when I got there. But I mean, the structure was mostly there. I just did all the little details. And I did the, um, the ticketing booths. The little the little boots i had to make those yeah and i helped out with some car paint stuff but i mean that was another artist so i mean i don't want to try to take credit for that i just i just helped out a little with some some um some tech info yeah there there was um definitely a lot of um uh, utilization for yoshi skill as well um i was a a, a lead digital artist um essentially lead, lead compositor there at fostering um for about four years um during that project um yeah there was a lot of um a lot of the process that we had taken from other shows, uh, for example, uh, HBO's The Deuce, which involved a lot of basically uh, sort of retrofitting the architecture, um, not just the architecture, but we're doing like everything from uh, things that shouldn't be there, uh, air conditioners for certain periods, or even making those period accurate, for example. Um, or uh, in this case, you know, like what Yoshi was talking about was the ticketing booths. Um, some of it was also more restorative as well, which, you know, we were filming, uh, well, I don't say we, because uh, <laughs> I wasn't part of the onset crew, but um, it feels like a team thing. Um, but sure. no, it was definitely, a, we were taking a lot of the, the footage of, uh, of the current bridge and we were doing a lot of the cleanup to make it essentially reflect how new and fresh it was during this time period. Um, so that was a big thing. Um, the same thing, uh, kind of, in, we had to do a lot of cleanup and enhancement of the vehicles as well. So sometimes that was either removing something as simple as crew reflections, um, but there was just like such painstaking detail that went into something as simple as making sure that the updates we made to the architecture matched in the reflections as the car was going by, you know, things like that. So um, <clears throat> there was definitely a lot of that. Um, we also worked uh, a lot on some of the, the scenes with, um, oh my gosh, I am <laughs> drawing a blank, terrible names. Um, Edward Norton and um, Alec Baldwin, <laughs> sorry, um, and, and, uh, in his office. And that was really challenging because it was supposed to be stationed in a real place, uh, a historical office that had that similar view where, um, where uh, there was that view to kind of supervise from the office, the actual building. Um, but what ended up happening is that some of the compositions demanded something a little bit different. And uh, sometimes we had to cheat things between the exposures that were actually there outside versus the dynamic range that was able to be captured inside. Obviously, they tended to expose for the performance. Um, and then it was up to us to seemingly like kind of figure out how to get the proper perspective and representation that made sense uh, both geographically, but also uh, to the narrative as well. Wow. Yeah. See, I, 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 I don't know. I always think of, I don't know, I guess the environmental effects kind of like where, you know, you, you almost don't notice that they're there, which that should be the, the goal, right? It's almost like you want it, you want it to be, to look so real that you don't even think about that, it, that it could be an effect. Well, well absolutely. That's, that's our job, right? If we do our job yeah. right, no one knows. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. Cause like there are different, um, there are different goals, different missions um, to different uh, kinds of effects. Right. Um, for example, in this case, what we're talking about would be more along the lines of what's called invisible effects, in which case, yes, the goal is to try to be a seamless and uh, and to really be more supportive of whatever story and narrative is being told rather than being um, the principal effect or somehow being a principal part of the plot. Um, and, and those have completely different uh, goals and aspects. Sometimes it's interesting because we we try to use the word photo real and a lot of times that simply means that we're trying to copy what it would have looked like if all of the elements that are put together 
were filmed at the same time through the same camera and the same lens. So there we have to figure out how that photography occurred. Copy the camera, copy the, or sorry, copy the movement of the camera, uh, the lens distortion, all sorts of things like that. But um, one of the things that, that we're able to do is essentially kind of go back and, um, I gotta put it, um, we can, uh, we, we can, shoot. Sorry, this is this question. what's that? You can make well, it real. Well, I guess the goal is, yes, uh, oh, I guess what I was trying to get at is another term called being photo believable, which is um, not to make everything look physically correct, but to make it look like it's cohesive with its environment. Because right. um, there's a lot of things that can be stylized. There's lots of things that can be pushed um, both uh, intentionally for narrative purposes. Think of something like Sin City or even 300 right. or the color grading and the, uh, the time manipulation and all that was all part of the narration. Um, versus, um, in this case, um, just kind of uh, bringing it together in a way that just made it more, uh, look, like I said earlier, looking like it was all filmed together. You know, that's the goal. That's, that's I think, usually the principal goal. See, that that's the stuff that kind of blows my mind is, is that there's, it's, it's weird how, like, for you guys, does it, What do you mean, us guys, aren't you a line producer? Well, I, well, I wasn't a line producer. I was a script supervisor. Big. Oh, you know. well, there you go. Weren't you a script supervisor? <laughs> well, I, yeah, but the way that you you approach your work, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's got to be different, like you said, based off of a, you know, we, we're trying to be this invisible thing versus, hey, we're we're doing this where this is the focus of the scene or of the shot. Mm -hmm. Like, is it almost more pressure when it's when it's you've got so much live action to deal with, or is it? I don't like, or is there pressure? I mean, I guess there is pressure, but uh, for me, there's always pressure either way. Like a film that you worked on, that we both worked on, you and I, Rob. Mm -hmm. uh, I provided certain equipment for the the crew and director to take on set reference photos for me for lighting, which they didn't do. <laughs> and uh, you know, I spent I spent like a hundred dollars on that camera too, and sent it. And like, hey, I need you to take a three hundred and sixty photosphere from the center location for CG reflection reference. Uh, yeah, didn't. no problem. So, yeah, no, they didn't. <laughs> and you know, they just unfortunately, made that job like ten thousand times harder. I bet. But you know, unfortunately, I, I think that's where um, there was a certain, um, I don't know, allure to this part of the field for uh, people that have a certain um, attraction to problem solving, uh, like myself and Yoshi, because um, especially towards the end of the pipeline, for me being more on compositing um, than on the three D side we're expected to just figure out how to solve the problem with whatever we're given. And, um, it, it, you know, it, it tended to, for me at least, it, it made me feel like, um, like the visual effects was in, in a certain way, it reminded me similar of uh, both of our histories in, in the Marine Corps, where essentially we're expected to do the most with the least amount of uh, resources, you know, and, um, and that's just the nature of not only the, the expectations that are set forth because of, reputation of i mean look at the work that's being done and the work that's being celebrated it is growing by leaps and bounds that i cannot even i can't fathom exactly every single time i feel like we push the boundary i'm like oh man this is insane how can it get better it keeps doing that it keeps surprising me and um even looking at a single franchise look at toy story the first toy story versus toy story 4 and granted the first toy story is still absolutely wonderful it's it's because it puts story first but um you see the evolution of what right. can be done so there the expectation also grows um and therefore it's no longer um expected to get really impressive approximations now it's audiences start picking up on the things that don't seem for whatever reason uh, correct or believable um uh, and there's a ever continuing like an, it's almost like an arms race between the audience and the artists you know to try to create that content man see and that's that's one of those things where like i think about like what would what would probably be the the most difficult thing to pull off is it is it like hair is it is it like a is it fabric a person just yeah just a person humans. period yeah. uncanny valley uncanny valley is still there it's very present and 
even that last one percent is the hardest to get yeah yeah and and even as the technology gets better although it lets us solve a lot of questions a lot of a lot of problems it the I wouldn't say misuse, but like not calibrating the use can result in unintended consequences all the time that results of going right back into the uncanny valley. You know, yeah, it's we just like that. Like, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the, uh, like you just look at one movie, Rogue One, right? Leia didn't look great, but Tarkin looked pretty awesome for the most part. But then there were those moments where it was just like, ah, wasn't quite right, you know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. it's, uh, I mean, it was it was good enough that people were like, wow, I can't believe he's still alive. And he's like, no, he's been dead since the 80s or something. I mean, you know, Peter yeah, Cushing. That's another thing is a, a lot of it, you got to remember, um, if you're already looking for it, you're going to find it. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, people that knew he was dead, obviously, they're going to be looking at it. They're, they're, they're already breaking it apart. Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, uh, this looks so real, they're going to say, they're going to be primed to ask how close to real does it look? Yeah. So, like, so my, my, mom, question. my mom had no idea he was CG when she watched the movie. Yeah. See, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome when you could pull, when, when a team can pull that, that kind of thing off. But yeah. No, and then, like, for me, the best CG person so far has been Rachel in Blade Runner 2049. Um, and, that's that's one of those circumstances where I feel like they did everything in their favor to make it look as good as possible. For example, the lighting in that scene is almost identical to the lighting of her scene in the original Blade Runner. That way they can use it as reference and to match. You know what I mean? They basically right. recreated the original scenes as closely as possible. So it's almost like, hey, worst comes to worst. We know what it's supposed to look like. There's a frame of reference you, you, we can yeah. find to it. Yeah, I think so. that, that definitely helps. And that's that's an interesting point that you bring up, though, because they did have a frame of reference, so you kind of have something uh, to literally compare against and to fine tune. Whereas trying to create something completely original and from scratch is still a huge challenge. Um, and if, if anything else, um, and just kind of um, looking at that, uh, how you're talking about um, uh, Blade Runner, it kind of made me think of uh, the what was it the shoot again with the names. Uh, anyways, the CG Arnold. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the, the name of the, the title, but um, the CG Arnold was absolutely flawless in sculpture and lighting until he started to move. You're talking um, about uh, the Terminator Genesis? Yes, I think it was. Yeah, where it basically recreated Terminator One. That, that scene. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, you know, there's two CG Terminators in there. There's um that first fight scene. Mm -hmm. That was the Terminator Two Terminator. Fighting the Terminator One Terminator. It wasn't old Arnold yet. You know what? I need to go back and rewatch that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the, but, the Terminator One Arnold was full CG, I think. Yeah, yeah. And the Terminator Two one, it was just a de aging face thing. Yeah, yeah. No, okay, yeah. No, I got that. I got that. But no, definitely the Terminator One is the one that I'm referencing. Where it, again, I think that it was really successful when it first appeared, and it had it was a locked off shot. And yep. I think that it allowed to sh demonstrate again, like you said, more of the physical side of it, which was the sculpture, the lighting um, and the integration and the recreation, but performance and recreating performance and human performance is another aspect or another calculation or factor into the uncanny Valley. And when that starts to move and when it starts to even simply not even just emote, but even interact with the lighting, those are the challenges that I think are extremely difficult that kind of give it away. Um, and yeah. not to say that it, like I said, that I, I can't say that I can do better myself in any way, shape or form. Um, but just things that I, you know, just observe. No, that's, and, and by the way, I am one of the, what few people or whatever that I actually like Terminator Genesis. I, I like parts of it. Uh, I mean, if you can, if you can, if you're not like super into the Terminator and the, the lore super, and all that stuff, I'm super into the lore. Yeah. So you, so yeah, you probably, it probably pissed you off, right? <laughs> no, I, I love, I loved it. Oh, really? Oh, really? I, I have, I own all the Terminator movies and uh, like the books. Uh, I have the, most of the games. The last game I played was actually the last one that came out, Terminator Resistance. I played yeah. through the whole game. And uh, just for the story alone, the gameplay is kind of whatever. It's it's like a watered down Fallout Three, mm. but the story is amazing. Basically, you're you're playing the first team to try to make it to the uh, the time portal, and uh, mm -hmm. throughout the game, the story mode is you meet people and they're like, yeah, 
a Terminator showed up, but it looked human. And you're like, no, that's not possible. Like this is like right at the beginning, you know, of that's everything. Cool. And so huh. there's in this in this in the game, you meet other people and you talk about like, oh, what did you do before this? And they're still talking about their old jobs and stuff, you know. So it's like it's it's really interesting. Oh. And then the the funny thing is they kind of reference the movies <laughs> too. Like there's a part where it's kind of an Easter egg, but you see like a dead body in one of the labs, and it's a uh, it's a uh, Robert Patrick's face. So you're like, what the fuck? So it's just like a little nod, you know, like, oh, maybe they use him as a, a, a reference point, you know, to make the T-1000. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, oh, so they, oh, interesting. Well, so see, the, I, last, the last mission, there's like Terminators coming at you, you know, the late, it's like the fights, the battle scenes in the flashbacks from Terminator 2. And you hear them over the radio talking like, they just sent another Terminator 2 through. That's two of them. So it's like, you got to remember like, oh, the movies, how many did they send back? When? And it's funny because after the game came out, they go, they sent more than one back. And then Terminator Dark Fate came out and it said in the beginning of the movie, they sent more than one back. And so it's, it's like all connected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I can really definitely cool. appreciate that. Yeah. See, And, and that, that's, that's why uh, uh, you probably saw I was sculpting a, a RoboCop head because uh, I wanted to do my own RoboCop Terminator like short fan film just for fun because I love the games and I love the story, the comic books. Like the fact that robocop's mind like being hooked up to the computer is what gave birth to true ai is brilliant hmm. yeah i think i have i think i have the first comic the the first one and i picked it up because i was like oh this is gonna be interesting and i was like ah, it's not for me <laughs> but but still it's okay to be wrong okay well maybe, <laughs> maybe i yeah maybe i need to pick it up maybe i need to go ahead and give him a shot well there's plenty of things though i mean the first time i read watchmen i didn't like it so yeah, and so Watchmen you're just bad is, at picking stuff. Do what? <laughs> so you're just bad at picking stuff. Yeah, here, yeah, well, back then I was, I guess. <laughs> no, no. But no, I mean that's. Yeah, but it, I, I think because if you look back at the original RoboCop movie, you know, one maybe two, and then the original Terminator one and two movies, I feel like aesthetically, tone wise, they could fit. It yeah. could totally fit. Hmm. You know, I mean, they might fit better than Justice League. I don't know. By the way, everybody, uh, Yoshi was like, "We need to do a show on Justice League because <laughs> he, like, he, you just hated that, right? I mean, you just, no, I didn't hate it. I didn't, I didn't hate you it. You were just frustrated um, with it. I like, I like parts of it. Uh, it's just, it's one of those movies where I feel like it's definitely for fans of Snyder and fans of the DC universe because I didn't understand a lot of it and I was lost a lot of the time. Mm. You know, what I mean, I think the analogy I gave you was like. So if we replace Darkseid with Thanos, I mean, maybe they explain something in the movie that I didn't catch, but I'm like, okay, so let's say Darkseid is Thanos and the um, the mother boxes or whatever is the Infinity Stones, the, the Infinity Gauntlet. So that's like them saying, well, Thanos is coming and that's scary. And everyone goes, well, why? He goes, well, he's coming to get the Infinity Stones. And if he gets that, he's going to fuck us up. Well, okay, well, what happens if he comes? Did he come before? Well, yeah, he came like hundreds of years ago. Yeah, and he had the Infinity Glove. Uh huh. And then what? Well, we kicked his ass. We like took the glove. We kept it. <laughs> and then uh, one of our guys almost killed him. And he was dragged off near death. So where's that guy now? Well, this girl killed him. Really? Yeah, pretty effortlessly. She's way stronger. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> when you break it so down like that. And he doesn't have the glove. And we kicked his ass last time with weaker people. So... I'm a little lost here as to how this guy is supposed to be a threat. And then, and then you say, okay, well, this guy's almost, this guy's a threat. He sent one of his top generals or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And they cut his head off (laughs) and he couldn't even put a scratch on Superman. And so we already see how strong Superman is compared to wonder woman in this universe. And wonder woman killed the guy that almost killed dark (laughs) side. So like, like I'm really like lost as to how this guy's supposed to be a threat. I, I just don't get it. You know, and mm. not to say there aren't cool parts, like the fight scenes, I think, are done really well. Some of the some of the shots, I think, are really nicely composited. Uh, some of the shots, are, you know, this Knight's composition, <clears throat> he does action scenes pretty well at times. Like I said, so it's not, I don't think it's bad. I, I definitely don't think it's his best movie. That's for damn sure. Do you feel that there's like certain ingredients that could be maybe made stronger? Like, for example, I think one of the one of the things that would answer your questions as to like, you know, why is this character a threat is I feel like there's, there's a less of a less attention to setting up this person's power level relative to 
Yeah, and you it, know, his only there. introduction is him basically getting his ass kicked. And, yeah. and the other thing that I didn't get was uh, he said something like, oh, there's no lantern and no Kryptonium here. And it's like, oh, so it's okay to go now. It's like, well, there was a lantern last time and no Kryptonium, and they still almost kicked your ass, and you killed the lantern. So that guy wasn't a threat to you either. So there's a lot of backwards, like, threat assessment here. It's like, there's no lantern. <laughs> the guy you killed last time? Yeah. Okay, so, do I'm, you, I'm lost. so do you think it, do you think it's more of the story itself, or do you think it's the way the story is being told? I, I don't know. I think the problem is that they did it backwards. You know, if they would have given time to build up, like, instead of doing the Justice League movie after, you know, just a few of the other movies, mm. or, yeah, I don't know, some other way to build up the character, because, you know, like, me not being familiar, if my first visual of this supposed, like, imposing character is him losing getting utterly destroyed that doesn't give me this clear image of him and the comparison i I gave rob was i'm like you know i didn't read a lot of comic books but i I watched a lot of you know the cartoons growing up like dc marvel Mm -hmm. so most of my knowledge comes from that but marvel when thanos showed up right away within the first five minutes you can assess the character you're like okay hulk punched him and could hurt him so he's not invincible but He's stronger than the Hulk, can fight faster, and then right off the bat, he kills the villain from the first movie. Like it was kills him, like effortlessly, Loki, yeah. right? Yeah, just yeah. just demolishes him, and then kills Heimdall. That would be exactly the same, except in DC, when Thanos showed up, that would be like Loki kicking his ass, almost <laughs> killing him, and then Thor kills Loki. And then Thanos is now coming to Earth. It's like, well, Thor's here. Oh, that's not a problem. Like, what, what do you mean it's not a problem? He killed the guy <laughs> like, I've, I've been like i I've been saying that. Yeah, yeah, I've been saying that since the the original, the Whedon cut came out. Yeah. Was that they just it was like DC said, <clears throat> Look at how popular Marvel is. Look at this. And look at look at Avengers. It was huge. We gotta do yeah. that. We gotta do that. We gotta do it right now. Yeah. Without yeah. without yeah. planting any of the seeds, without yeah. you know building up characters and the lore and all that stuff. Because yeah. I mean, they've been it's, building it's up hard. Thanos for years. Yeah. yeah or at the very least, at the very least, even having a scene that establishes where in the hierarchy this character sits, because right. it could completely change the approach for those who don't know any of the who aren't introduced into the the comics or the lore. It'd be like, oh wait, is this like a revenge story? Is this like the guy getting back? Or and like no, yeah. like you know, it's or even like, even what's her what's her name? Her Was it Helena? In Thor Ragnarok. Oh, his uh, sister. Yeah, um, when she yeah. shows up, she crushes yeah. Milner. Yeah, yeah. With her hand. I mean, like yeah, right yeah. away, you're like, oh wow, she's like somebody. It established <laughs> that. Yeah, it established that power. But the yeah. whole Justice League movie, I couldn't see anything that showed me Darkseid was supposed to be a threat except his talking. You know, it's like I, I don't, I don't get it, but I do understand. It's hard for me because I have a lot of friends that are Snyder fans, mm-hmm. like you know, Jose, Justin. Yes. He, he says he's not. He says he's not. But I told him, like, do you see anything wrong ever in any of his movies? He's like, no, but I wasn't looking either. I'm like, you've seen Justice League the Snyder Cut four times. You saw nothing wrong. So why are you telling me I'm wrong when I say that to you he can do no wrong? When literally you said he did no wrong. But anyways, so uh, the way four times. Him, like, yeah, he's out four times. The thing is, I told him, I'm like, look, I don't hate the movie. I think there's a lot of flaws, but I see the appeal. If you're a fan of the previous Snyder DC movies, I would be willing to bet that you will like this one. It's it's everything you could have wanted. That, you know, And I'm sure it's one of those things. And we all know, people say, oh, the shots were already filmed, so you can't edit that much. But we all know how much of a difference like five minutes of an edit can make. You've seen director's cut movies where it's like literally eight minutes of difference and it feels like a different movie. You know, just a little snip here, a little cut there. So mm-hmm. I think the benefit is that because the Whedon cut came out and it was all over Reddit, people were discussing it. Snyder fans were discussing it on Reddit, on Facebook, on social media. So imagine now being a director who had another version of your quote unquote movie come out and you get to sit there and read all the criticisms from your fans. Yeah. And the fans that said like, oh man, Snyder, I would have liked this. I, I think Snyder would have done this better. And then you have all that now going in to edit your movie. <laughs> it's like you got a screener before your first edit. Yeah. You, you got to get the ugly baby out of the way. So that being said, I, I can understand the appeal for fans of his movies and of the DC universe. And it was talking to my friend Justin, who was a big DC fan, that I realized like, why is this? Why is that? I kept asking him questions like, oh, because of this, 
And I'm like, is that from the comics? He's like, yes. I'm like, see there, that's, I get it. And uh, one of my other friends was the one that told me, he's like, well, that's fine. I'm not saying it's a great movie for everyone. I'm saying that as a DC fan, this is a movie for me and I'm okay with that. Just yeah, give us fine. one for the fans, the fan sure. service movie. And I'm like, okay, I, I get it. I, I understand the appeal, but I, I wouldn't call it a good movie in my eyes. I don't, I don't think it's terrible, but it's also a, a very, very unique circumstance. And it seems like it's a DC thing. I don't know. They did it with they got Superman 2, and then you got Superman 2, the Donner <clears> cut. And now you got Justice League, and then Justice League, the Snyder cut. And it's like, all right, well, this is, I hope they have keep it a DC tradition. And next time they have like another movie that's another director's cut. I just wish they would just, if you're going to do something big, take your time, you know? Yeah. And if you, if you, if you plant those seeds, they're going to grow into something amazing, you know? And yeah. it, it's... And I also don't, don't like that people give just weed and crap. Now, if you want to criticize them as a person, that's fine. I don't really care. But I'm talking about, they're like, oh, he ruined the movie and made a shitty movie. And my thought process is like, okay, he came into another director's project with hundreds of hours of footage already shot in a studio telling him, we want you to do Avengers. Right. So it's like, what else what is he going to do? Gonna do? Yeah, like, what are you supposed to do? You're like, you're working with what you have, you reshoot yeah. what you have. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. So it's, it's, it's an, it's just like an interesting case study, you know, to see someone putting together another person's vision and then another director coming back to put it back together. And it's, I said, From a filmmaker standpoint, this is like super interesting. Yeah, and and that's what I said because I I likened it to like if they went back to Lord and Miller and said, "Hey, you want to come back and and do solo? You know, like redo it? You know, you want to you want to finish what you started? That's that's kind of like what this is. It's never. I don't think it's ever happened like this before. Because even mm -hmm. like you know Ridley Scott's done all of his Ultimate Editions and director's cuts. Coppola's done yeah. his. But none of them the only, are on this scale. The only other one I can think of that's the closest is probably uh, I think I think it's the hateful is it hateful eight? Yeah, the, yeah. The, the Netflix version was yeah. different. Yeah, which was good. I, I enjoyed that. But it's also, I guess it's one thing for. I still feel like that's more of like a director's cut, you know, kind of thing. This was hey, we you basically left the project and years later you get to come back and finish what it. about godfather the the godfather um the one that just came out what is it called <sighs> oh the the death of michael corleone yeah i have it too i still haven't seen it yeah it's i, I mean it. if you're if you're a fan of godfather 3 it's it's not better it's just different and it's got a different feel and it it almost refocuses things you know, and it, it I think for people who had never seen the original, it might make it better because there's less Sofia Coppola in it. <laughs> but it's not a, it's not like a huge thing. It's not like it's not like Snyder Cut for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's it's, mm -hmm. it's super interesting to me, you know, like how the whole thing played out and uh, getting to have that that insight, you know, on social media and Reddit It's like, oh. Fans want this. Okay, they all talk about it. All right, let, let, let's put a little of that. Or they don't like this. Let's get that out of there. Oh, they hated the design. <laughs> you know, like well, there, therein lies exactly what I was talking about earlier. That it's that arms race between the audience and the, and the creators because uh, it's that expectation that changes. You know, I, I always, we always kept making the joke about you know, um, you know, back in the day when people ran out of the theater because there was the train on the screen for the first time. Can you imagine showing them Transformers? Like they were just like their heads would explode, you know. They would not know what to do. There's no frame of reference for it. As we start creating um, those frames of reference, then there's something to judge against, and there's a different demand. So again, therein lies that um, the double-edged sword where you I deliver have a that. You can say when you're done. Yeah. What's up? So I have a theory, and this is from a CG standpoint mm -hmm. of why of uh, Steppenwolf's new design with the spike armor. Mm -hmm. I think that CG wise, that was the easiest choice to do in order to make it easy to composite and light because it's so reflective with tiny little specks yeah. that it's always moving. So yeah, you're yeah. like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's... I, you know, I, I don't know. I can't speak to the decision making on that. I, I mean, you that... get my point, right? Because yeah, yeah, I there's get... so many variables. That yeah. It's like, oh, it just looks like busy movement. Yeah, yeah, movement. And that's, that's uh, again, that's uh, definitely, uh, there's a bell curve to that for sure. Where um, 
I, I keep telling people that when I'm working on things, it is so much more difficult to work on things that have really small minor movements, like a character trying to stand still is so much worse than trying to, you know, deal with a character who's got some crazy gestures and is like, the camera is moving a little bit more crazy because uh, that movement does, uh, it's a lot more forgiving. And if you have the, the proper techniques to try to replicate whatever's happening on the camera, um, the leeway for that is so much more. Whereas if you have something that's such a minor, minute change, and it is, uh, it, you're trying to keep it um, in a certain way to look correct, um, again, therein, go, therein lies the uncanny valley. All those subtle little tiny imperfections is, and little subtleties and imperfections in the performance are what make it seem realistic. Um, so yeah, maybe that might be a possibility that they're kind of trying to make it so that I hope they're not trying to pull focus from either the character performance well, I, I or like something from else. A but, CG, from a CG rendering standpoint? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's all chrome and reflective and always moving. The lighting just has to generally be right. It doesn't have exactly. to be spot on. That's what I'm saying. That yeah, there's that approximation that get, makes it uh, more acceptable. By the way, I'm pretty sure that's like that looks like the Fresh Prince house up there. It, yeah, it does. Anyways, sorry. Oh, uh, man. that's funny, man. You look like you're on duty, man. Out in the field, <laughs> just sitting on a box by some random. Gate. <laughs> <laughs> you just making sure nobody can get in. Is that exactly? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now let me ask you this, because you guys have worked on a bunch of different projects, movies, TV shows, video games, right? I mean, both of Yoshi you, has right. Uh, Yoshi has. Uh, I haven't really delved into the uh, the video game world uh, yet, but well, what's uh, Yoshi has my next yeah, games and film. Never mind. Yeah, both. Well, so from your both of your standpoints, really, mm -hmm. what? Are there differences in like the time or the, not just the timeline, but the pipeline? Like, does it, is it just everything sped up when you're on like a TV show, a streaming show or whatever? Like, like what are the, what are the differences? I'm curious. There's definitely different pipe, uh, timelines for sure. Um, so on the extreme side uh, in comparison, even shorter than episodic, I would probably put commercial. Commercial has very, very quick timelines. Um, episodic I think is probably, the uh, has the pros and cons of kind of both feature and uh, and commercial. Um, it has a, a faster uh, timeline than or uh, than film or, or feature. However, uh, again, it can still be very scrutinized, like features are, and not as a. I wouldn't say the commercials get away with more, but there's more of a, a of a mindset that nobody's gonna start like frame by frame in a commercial, most likely. Um, and trying to find maybe Easter eggs in the commercial unless that's something that's part of the marketing thing. So um, therein lies why um, more scrutiny is paid to the episodics, more so with features because those are usually expected to be on the larger screen as well as uh, being able to be uh, accessible by the public either through streaming or uh, through other content that you can go and pause or go frame by frame, you know, because some people do that and for different reasons. Um, some people for Easter eggs, some people for um, literally like, I, I do have some friends that would go through that and be like, okay, well, let's look at this animation. I want to know how this animation was done and they would use it as a reference, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just interested in, in effects and, and yeah. editing. I think editing is, can be really, really fun. Like, like I always go, go back to Aliens. James oh, Cameron. Yeah. That, movie has so many cuts in it it almost shouldn't work but it works <laughs> it works so well but there's so many shots it's it's crazy it's like the second unit must have been really busy because they were there's tons of shots of someone grabbing a gun yeah, and yeah. and point of view shots and and just all of these you know the camera moves right all those camera moves have got to be like oh my god you guys had to be so busy <laughs> yeah yeah but definitely i i think adding any camera move to any shot like makes the complication exponential <laughs> yeah yeah like on every well especially if you're having to do effects oh, on it I'm, I'm with you like even no matter where i go i hate saying it but they're like what is the best scenario for you i'm like locked camera yeah yeah right. like yeah like yeah i'm like if you want to move it that's fine i'm just saying if you're asking me honestly locked camera yeah <laughs> uh the, a locked camera, bald actors. Uh, what else do you want? <laughs> you know? 
yeah no, no nothing on the walls it's a white building <laughs> yeah yeah there you go you know what your movie should take place on a green screen there you go <laughs> So just on the green screen, not just removed, on, just on the green screen. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, um, well, Yoshi, with with games, how does how does it differ there, or can you? Um, it, it is because with games, when I make an asset, I have less resources. I have to take into account poly count, texture resolution, you know how well it works in the scene. Uh, in addition to, it has to look good from every angle. I, I can't um, just make something one sided, you know, like. With CG, a lot of times, even buildings, they're just like real movie sets. They're facades. Why, right. why would I build everything else? You know, that doesn't make sense. But for games, it doesn't work that way. You, you got to make it. You know, or like in film, if I make, let's say I make a dinosaur for some Jurassic Park or something. And I'm like, ah, this shot, I kind of messed up the rig. The lighting's a little off. Like, yeah, but you only see it from this angle for four seconds. All right, just make this look really good from this angle. And mm -hmm. on, on the other side of the camera, the arm might be bent in a weird way. It's just you can't see it. You know, it's just so yeah. it's out of the way. You know, there's just stuff you're not going to see. You know, or um, hmm. let's say some character's holding something that disappears in the movie scene. It might just actually go behind him or into a wall. They do the same thing in games, too, actually. But with games, you have to be more mindful of how you do certain things. And... Um, yeah. Like, I'm sure people have seen all the time, you load up a game and they're like, there's something in the distance that's floating in the sky, like a door. It's like, oh, is that a secret door? It's like, no. What it is, is the artist probably had the door in the scene to use as reference, maybe for scale, to figure something out. And when they- uh, And then forgot to remove it. it. They just put it on the side. They just set it to the side. That's what I do. <laughs> I have like a little group of assets to the side of the scene that I pull from. Mm -hmm. And he just maybe forgot to delete it or you know whatever the case may be. And- there's other little tricks too, like for example, audio. In film, you just edit the audio, or if a character appears, you just composite them. You, you know, you edit them in. Whereas in a game, that doesn't work that way. The memory can't load that fast, so you actually have to load the character ahead of time and just hide them somewhere, mm -hmm. so that when they talk, it pops in. For example, in a like Half Life Two, when you're talking to someone on the intercom, like on the TV, the character's actually in another room off camera talking like the character model hmm. yeah yeah they have it all loaded and you know for example oh red dead redemption there's like i think there's a couple of haunted houses and you can hear people talking in the haunted house what it really is is they put npcs in an empty room below the house <laughs> talking it's so funny how like in a certain way like video game design mirrors like old school like vaudeville how do we get this effect but not digitally like oh well let's hide a bunch of actors on the floor yeah when you ride the subway and i think it's fallout three or four mm -hmm. i don't remember when you ride the oh, subway yes it, it it changes the people? yeah it changes perspective to first person so you're looking yeah. out the window of the the subway or the the train or whatever right mm -hmm. so the way it really works in engine is that they actually attach the subway car to the character's head they, and they, they lock them into place they, they they couldn't they couldn't actually get it to lock to the the, the track so they actually programmed it to be a hat it, it's worn yeah. as a hat by the character and they're animating the character walking along the yeah so your under, character under the road kind of subway car hat yeah and so if you do certain cheats or mod the game you can actually like exit the subway i guess and walk around but you'll have a subway car <laughs> as your head <laughs> subway car hat that's awesome yeah yeah oh uh, man so a, lot, a lot of little funky tricks like that yeah now Here's here's another thing that I was planning on asking both of you, but uh, y Yoshi, you doing okay on on time and all that? Yeah, I'm gonna head out, I'm gonna head out in like five minutes. Okay. okay. So I wanted to ask about this because I'm I'm a I'm a dork when it comes to movie stuff all the time. You know, just no matter what it is, it's editing, writing, directing, mm -hmm. and effects. I love effects, and I loved learning about effects. I watched the uh, the documentary about the Mandalorian and about the stagecraft technology and the volume and all that stuff. And I know that you guys didn't work on, on that specific part, but do you think that's the future of this kind of movie making episodic it's, it's filmmaking? Say, because I feel like it's not any different. I feel like technology wise, it's exactly the same. It's just being presented differently hmm. because we've had camera tracking forever. Right? Camera tracking, green screen. Sorry, in a second. Cars driving by. 
We have a camera tracking, green screen. We've had that technology around for a while. It's not new. Uh, and we've had to build CG environments for a while. This doesn't change anything except it cuts out one step. It's a compositing step, kind of. You still have to composite. You still have to adjust. So basically, it's instead of filming, tracking that, and then putting the CG environment in, you're just doing it all in one step because now we have the, the engine to do it in real time. So yeah. that's all it is. So all the assets still have to be made. You still have to model and texture them. You still have to light it. There, there's, you know, there's really only a, a, a few in between steps that are being eliminated. If that makes any sense, there, are, there is a the major benefit, and I think Jose likes this one too, is the lighting, because they are on a stage where it's projecting an actual, you know, screen. If there's a ship that flies by that has a red light, it's going to cast that red light on the actor, and that's like the big kicker, uh, is matching lighting, uh, and that's not that something that. Jose and I can do on our end. I mean, we can try to, you know, like Jose, for sure, being talented, he can try to fix it as much as he can, but matching the lighting on set is key. That's, you know, fixing well, that is a yeah. But that shifts that timeline, right? To the beginning of, the, of you know, it's, it's almost pre-production in a way, well, right? Well, here I, I kind of want to touch on what Yoshi mentioned here. And while he is right in that, it is taking um, a very similar goal and presenting a new tool and technique for it that is saving a lot of time. Um, I feel like it's become much more than just the tool for the for the part of the pipeline that it was designed for. It's expanded so much more into pre-production and ability to now create um, opportunities for uh, better decisions faster and thus improve on the cost, the time, and Lord knows the iterations for any kind of effects. Um, so all of that is going to be very similar to any kind of advancements in, in, in technology that we've had in visual effects in that there's still a similar goal. The, the goals um, do tend to remain the same um, fundamentally. However, every time that there's a new technology that allows us to do something uh, easier or faster, the quality also goes up. It's not it's not uh, inversely related where, oh, we can do this faster, but now it looks terrible. Usually there is um, the, the ability to work faster and to work smarter allows more room for creativity and for fine tuning and refinement. So I think this is going to be another aspect of that. Um, one of the things that I teach, I have a, uh, I teach a, a visual effects and compositing class uh, at Montclair State University here in Jersey. And one of the things um, that I teach them is not simply just the how to use the tools. So in this case, we're using Nuke, but um, I teach them some of the history. Um, teach them about uh, George Melier when it comes to um, some of the visual effects, if you will, and how that's been there from like the very beginning. Um, we talk about uh, Max Fleischer when it comes to rotoscoping. And the reason that I bring those things up is I go, what was their goal? What were they trying to achieve in these films? What was the effect or what was the outcome? And then compare it to you know, go into 1970s when we started introducing CG with Tron and Star Wars. You know, you go all the way up uh, into the 90s where we had leaps and bounds uh, with lighting and, and rendering and so on and so forth. And each time that has been the same kind of goals that should be, sometimes this is forgotten, but should be serving the storytelling. Either way, it still is an expression of the, the director or whatever you know, company Marvel or whomever right. might be behind it, whatever it is that they're trying to convey, um, it's still trying to convey that message and all the tools are going to be the same, you know, or sorry, not the tools are going to be the same. The, the, the results that we're trying to get are going to still be very similar. Right. And it's another way to do it better and faster now. Yeah. I mean, it's, to me, it's like, I was trying to look at it from very, my limited knowledge of visual effects okay it, like mm -hmm. actual actually doing it like i understand the concepts and things like that but I, i've never done it myself but i would think that from a any effects house right they go okay so you're gonna pay us and you're gonna you're gonna have us work on the all of the environmental stuff at the beginning but then after print you know your photography's done and you're now in post now you're having us go back and add in stuff you know, add in elements that it seems like, okay, so we're basically getting a larger length of time to work on this project almost, mm -hmm. you know, and they might have an idea on set. Oh man, I really want, I really want a ship flying over my, the, the actor's head at this point. And y'all, you, you know, you guys can go in and add that stuff in later. But then on top of that, just like, you know, 
the 360 thing that, that we forgot to do for you, Yoshi. You've already got all that information, right? So now you can just, it seems like it would streamline that process too, the post pro, uh, production pro, part of it, right? Yeah, that, that's that's what I was mentioning earlier with the, the lighting. Yeah. It's the biggest thing, thing for me as a CG artist. Uh, just to clarify, it doesn't change much for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, because you're uh, still doing, you're doing the yeah, thing. I, I still got to make everything. So right. for me, it doesn't change much. But like going off what Jose said, everything that's faster is better because you get to spend more time focusing on making the art as opposed to just trying to make it work. And, um, mm. you know, that, that's one of the biggest bottlenecks uh, to, to, to chain back to your earlier comment about film versus, you know, television, for example, or games. Um, with television, there's just less time. You know, it's like, okay, right. you have this shot, you have two days to do it. Uh, whereas in film, that two day milestone, that marker would have been like, okay, this is a good pass. Let's give it a little more love. Let's get another pass in another two weeks. And in another two weeks, we're going to look at it again after that, you know, because it's, it's a movie. You want right. it to look as good as possible. You want to sit there in a, for, forgive the phrase, but I can't find a better term, but Jose might remember it. Yeah, you sit there and you pixel fuck it. You know, <laughs> you're, you're pushing pixels. You're like, yeah. Uh, just a little more, you know. <laughs> I've, I've gotten a note once uh, when I was working on a stereoscopic film with Sony to move a character, the shine in a character's eyes and, and a quarter pixel in each direction for the stereoscope effect. They're like, that's really going to bring this character to life. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> I don't think that's how that works. It's, wow. Oh, that's, that's, that's a that's, good point, too, with Jose, uh, what he said about... um like the, the screen being bigger, mm -hmm. even though we have 4K TVs, if I'm working on a movie that I know is going to be an IMAX, there's a huge difference. With the scrutiny. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, it was uh, my old supervisor used to say, yeah, the film's going to get blown up, but so are all of your mistakes. <laughs> right. Like that one, that one roto edge you didn't clean up, that's going to be five feet tall. You know? <laughs> Like my one frayed wire in Rise of Skywalker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know how many uh, times I've watched those, that, those shots? I've watched it. <laughs> Looking for some Easter eggs? Uh, well, a little bit, but I'm also just, I don't know. It's It was awesome work. And like I said, I, I've, I've been pretty transparent, I think. I'm not the biggest fan of the movie itself, the story. You know, the, kind of the, some of the things they broke. Talk about lore breaking. Oh my gosh. But dude, visually that movie is stunning. It's just stunning. So it's like, and that's one of the things that, and actually kind of leads to another question. Cause I, Yoshi, I've asked you this too. It's like, like when a, when a movie isn't very well received, are you able to divorce yourself from that? You know, or you, some of the work that you, cause you like, I could, very simply look at it like, well, you know, they're, they're having a problem with the, the acting or the writing. They're not having a problem with, with what I did. What I did was awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it, it does, it does, it does suck because it's, it's part of a team effort. Right. And this movie was made by a team and with, with rise of Skywalker, there were a lot of, like I said, the movie has its issues. I'm aware, you know, I'm, I'm, but you gotta remember too, like a major actor died another mm -hmm. director in the middle changed things, you know, and then you got this person coming in trying to, you know, there's it, a lot of other factors. It's, it's like, like I said, it's like the, the Whedon cut or even the Snyder cut. It's, it wasn't made the way it was meant to be. There, there were other factors. So you, you got to take it as it is, you know, it, right. it, it is what it is. And there's, so, there's that other element yeah. that, that, that human element that kind of becomes a part of that, that um, sometimes people are like, Oh, you know, I don't like the quality that, you know, the effects on this was bad or blah, 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 this and that. And like, I, you know, I no longer, it's been years since I ever looked at someone and thought, oh man, the work that was on that was bad, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, I go like, hey, what was your budget? Or what was the time they gave you? Or what was this or that? And, and not to say that it was on somebody personally, but that was as, you know, the team as a whole, sometimes the right. company as a whole. And um, those aspects, like what Yoshi's talking about with the changes in director and, and you know, death of actors. And um, I, you know, that is something that is, going to be, affect the production it's going to affect the, the outcome regardless of who's at the helm and uh, um, that's something that unfortunately when trying to tell a story kind of gets um, kind of second kind of backseat by the fans a certain amount because yes the story is king and 
at the same time, there's there's human factors that are behind getting those out to the audience. Yeah, there's just tons of things that can happen <laughs> yeah. that will affect. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, Yoshi, do do you need to do you need to head out? Well, all right then, Yoshi. Thank you right. again for uh, for coming out or coming on. For sure. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, I'm sure we'll have you on again at some point. You but, should keep uh, chatting with Jose. Oh, I'm <laughs> for sure. I am. I've got. I've, I, I still have a lot of questions for him. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm ready. Transformers, Titanic, dude's been through it all. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I was looking through his IMDb, going, "Oh my God, yeah. okay." <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we're yeah, we're just gonna take. Yeah, we're gonna take a real quick break, and we'll That's be right it. back. Okay, be right back. I won't be. There he is. Sorry, Hello. I just I was just you know, just figured I was I was here. I could go ahead and, you know, put the camera on me. A little bit, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, like I said, thank you again for just for being here. Cause I, I, I love talking to people that, that work on this stuff and that take the time to, they're so, everybody's so thoughtful about their work and I love that. And one of the things that I've always said is that there's, you know, you watch a movie and a lot of people, they just look at it as disposable entertainment. They don't think about the work that goes into it. It's for me, it's been a lifelong love of the making of movies and how things are done. And, you know, I remember yeah. the one, the, the first thing that really blew my mind was, uh, way back in the lost world, Jurassic huh. park two. Yeah. When the, they're trying to capture the dinosaurs. They're like roping them or something. And one lifts one up and a guy like goes flying. I'm like, okay, how did they do that? <laughs> and then you, you know, when you see the making up, you're like, oh, well, that makes sense. Instead of green screening the background, you're green screening the thing. And then yeah. you just put in the, I, lo I love that stuff. It's just, yeah. I've always loved it. So uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that's, being that's, here. Absolutely. But, it's my pleasure. Oh, no problem. Yeah. And I wanted to ask a little bit, because we didn't, again, we, we had limited time with Yoshi. Mm -hmm. The Visual Effects Society. Yes. Can you can you talk about that? I, I was I read a little bit about it, but I'm I'm not exactly sure about it. So yeah. uh, sure. Um, so basically, the Visual Effects Society is a, is a nonprofit organization. Um, it's it kind of exists to um, be an honorary society to kind of bring recognition to a lot of the artists who are working in this field. Um, so far, the visual effects is a field where um, sometimes there was a lot of well, there still is, and there has been a lot of progress made. But um, it was a, a department that wasn't always recognized or certainly didn't always feel like it was as respected as, as some people feel it should be. Um, so one of the ways that um, the Visual Effects Society has um, kind of tried to build that camaraderie and build that visibility for visual effects artists is, again, um, recognition of their accomplishments within the technical fields as well as the creative, um, as well as establishing um, abilities for networking um, and enrichment through education. So a lot of, um, you know, working with partnering softwares for uh, asset companies or even studios themselves, um, creating mixers and uh, networking opportunities and things like that. Um, and if nothing else, panels constantly, screenings as well, and pretty much anything that anybody would want to, uh, to utilize to figure out you know what's going on in the industry and kind of where they are within that and what they want to do so yeah it's kind of what, what the the general goal of the organization is that's awesome and and it's it's <clears throat> one of those things where it's like um i mean what you're talking about is like the academy awards oh the technical yeah. they get their yeah. own little thing and we're, we're gonna just <laughs> we're just gonna blow through it you know just bam 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 and sure. it's just like but these i mean i Look, I don't know firsthand, but I know that you guys put in just a crazy amount of work and there's a there's a crazy amount of passion in what you do. Yeah, so absolutely. it 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 was always one of those things that always kind of bugged me too. You know, it was like well, why you know, the, look at what they've done. You know, it's just <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think and, it's and an it's old school thinking, you know what I mean? Like, oh, well they they weren't there putting the the they didn't make the clothes, so you know, you know, and, and that's that's the that's part of that frustration because even within the visual effects industry specifically, um, with it, you know, as part of the film industry, um, there's so much more of a spirit of of camaraderie because literally everything we do takes a team effort, you know, yeah. across the board. So there's this um, 
the sort of expectation that that gets extended beyond the visual effects industry um, for a lot of people. Um, sometimes that's not the case. And again, there's always you know outliers of one end of, I wouldn't call it a spectrum because I feel it's more dimensional than just a binary kind of choice there. But yeah, you have people that might be more towards one thing or another, but yeah. See, I think that's, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I was looking through all those pictures too on, on uh, IMDb and I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, he's Darren Aronofsky. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. cool. You know, just, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. It's got, was... it's got to be awesome to meet all these people and to learn from them and be appreciated by them too. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And here's the thing though, is that there's by no means, um, does the visual effects society, uh, like hand that over on a silver platter. Like I got to go to that event because I was associated with it. Um, I think that year I have been, I was nominated for one of the categories, um, but it was still up to me. And really I am not that person. My wife is the one who is like this social butterfly when you go to like any kind of these events. And she was also in, in the visual effects industry. She had uh, since moved on to, uh, to writing. But um, yeah, she is no fear when it comes to social interactions. And I kind of try to mimic that. And sometimes that gets me in a situation where I can, uh, you know, meet really cool people, you know? Um, so yeah, I <laughs> definitely have heard of credit for that. <laughs> well, and it's, it's, it's funny too, because like Yoshi is exactly the opposite of what I expected. When, when you hear, I don't know, I, I don't, I, I guess it's just because like when I'm, I don't know, it, it's just different personalities. I'm sure there's different personalities and, and the, that whole spectrum of personalities in every yeah. job in the world. But at the same time, it was like, he was so like, yeah, yeah you just ask me anything. What do you, what do you want to know? And it's just no, like, absolutely. really? I thought you were going to be like, oh, I can't tell you that. It's like, you know what uh, I mean? No. But no, he... I don't know. He was just so patient with me and probably to get over my like, dude, you made all these things, you know? <laughs> ah. Sure. Sure. And, and it's, it's funny because, um, I, I think that that was something that when I felt burnt out or when I felt unsure of where to go or to even continue in, in my career, that spirit was there. The spirit of collaboration was so prevalent. Um, again, there are outliers from time to time, uh, in the military, we always used to say, Hey, you always got that 10%. Um, I think it's much smaller than that, but, um, but yeah, for the most part, there is that, that wanting to, uh, be helpful and willing to, to talk to someone, whether they understand it or not. Um, meaning like from an inside perspective or a technical perspective. Um, but yeah, if there's that interest, I, I think there's a, this weird line that sometimes gets blurred. Yoshi and I used to talk about this a lot where, um, say like, for example, I, I met someone uh, a few years ago on an air, uh, on an airplane and we were talking about what we do. And, um, you know, the question always seems to come up like, Oh, well, you know, have you have worked on anything I'd recognize? And it feels cool to be able to say like, Oh, you know, to be able to suggest some things that are definitely recognizable. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've had a chance to work on, uh, I think one of my, the earliest um, features I got to work on was the first Avengers. Um, and then since then very small roles, but still, you know, I, I put that on my reel um, with the role that I had, um, you know, really great productions like Game of Thrones um, and then later working on cool things. I had a blast working on Greatest Showman um, and a couple other features, but um, again, it was, it was this thing where you start talking about those things or you start talking about who you've worked with. And it's such a normal thing within our industry that you're more or less trying to figure out information. Oh, did you work on this production? Oh, yes or no. Oh, were you at this studio? Yes or no. And to people who might overhear a conversation like that out of context, it almost sounds like a competition or a name dropping, but like nine times out of 10, it's completely oblivious to that. It's more of like, we're just trying to figure out where we have common ground. That's all the time. Did we work at the same place or did we work with the same people? Or maybe did we work on the same project across different studios, you know? Um, and that always seems to be kind of a, kind of an introductory conversation that seems to eventually come up. Um, and it's not bloating, it's not name dropping. It's simply, 
trying to assess kind of where we know each other from, you know, yeah. and it's weird because you talk to people sometimes that aren't in the industry. Uh, and when I say industry, I mean like more of um, in the creative industries in general, not just filmmaking. Um, because I can go to, for example, um, someone who's an illustrator for, you know, a, a, a publisher and talk to them about, uh, oh, you know, uh, uh, you know, me and Yoshi, one time we got to do this pitch uh, at a company we worked at for Larry Hama. And it's like they would understand that, okay, that's really cool. Or like there would be a, a context to it to understand why it's relevant to the conversation instead of it just being like, oh, well, you're just name dropping, you know? Um, so it's really interesting to try to um, explain what we do um, and not get into the weeds. And at the same time, like, I will be happy to get into the weeds. And like as deep as anybody has an interest to go, I'm happy to talk about. But there's also that like not wanting to, I don't know, scare someone off or like be like, I don't know, yeah, get too much into like the details of it that it's no longer interesting, but for a very, very uh, niche audience. You know? Yeah, you can see their eyes glaze over as you start <laughs> yeah. getting into mesh and all exactly. of these. Yeah. <laughs> yeah see, yeah. The, the weird thing is, is I have a very working knowledge of that. I remember mm -hmm. it would have to be probably the early 2000s. Back in the, uh, you know, the, the where's days, mm -hmm. yep. I messed around with, uh, with Maya and with, uh, 3d studio max and stuff like that back mm -hmm. in the day. And yeah. it was just like, it, I'm just don't have the brain for that. You know what I mean? And like, I'm a sure. music guy, you know, yeah. or a sound guy. That's yeah. you, you want to mm -hmm. talk sound. I can talk sound with you, but yeah. the, that part of it, that visual stuff, I just could never, you know, and like, you know, the stuff that I do on, on order 42, it's not, it's not anything hard. It's not intricate or anything, but it looks nice. And that's all I care about. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, and that's as far as I've gone. <laughs> it's like, but, I don't need see, to go any further. Yeah. But see, you've touched on a couple things. Number one, a, I think it's awesome that you went and you found something that clicks for you because it's not this, you're right. It's not the same for everybody. Um, and in fact, I actually started off as a, as an animator. Um, I spent uh, I think like two or three years as, as, a, as a 2D animator and trying to get 2D animation gigs and doing the training. Um, and then eventually uh, started going into the 3D side, looking at that pipeline and still trying to be a 3D animator. Um, and then eventually found compositing and did that for like 11 years straight. You know, it clicked for me and it felt like um, I, I understood kind of, like I said, I was able to go back and grasp the principles in order to be helpful. but there wasn't, there was just something that didn't necessarily call to me. And I, if I was going to put that much time into it, I might as well. Yeah. Um, I, I think there was a, I don't want to call it the path of least resistance because it's still a lot of work, but there is a certain, um, there's just certain things, certain techniques or certain um, fields that hopefully everybody finds something that they enjoy and that they, that makes sense to them because that brings the enjoyment to it, you know? Yeah. And that's, yeah. I don't know. I, I, it, like I couldn't get into it with, you know, with the mesh and I mean, I get the, the concept and I get the idea, but then I'm like, but how do you, where do you start? Like, I don't even know where you, where you would start, oh, yeah. but you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, but you know, that that's the other thing too, is that even though I went through that path, um, again, so to kind of give you some background, I, uh, one of my closest friends is named Sean Barber and, um, he's out in California and he was the one who introduced me to 3d studio max when we were in high school. Um, as well as Premiere. Um, I had no idea these things existed. I had no idea these, like how these things were done. And um, we ended up uh, kind of joining slash starting a club at school. The school ended up following year able to get uh, one classroom's worth of licenses of Max. And this is like, like I think it was uh, like Max, like three, some, like 3.1 or something like that. We still had the hardware locks and everything else. And, um, and we messed around with it and we like we enjoyed it it made sense to us and to a certain extent and obviously there was different concepts that we were not applying we weren't filmmakers yet so you know our compositions weren't exactly great or this and that but we were learning the techniques and really for the most part we were just given the freedom to experiment and to try to go okay if i want to do this how do i do that and then we would put our heads together and a lot of times a lot of it was him really he he was uh usually showing me like oh man like he had like a render a day it seemed like at one point um but um 
yeah, from there, like I still didn't have any idea about compositing. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know about render layers or, I mean, at that point we were lucky to save an image onto a, uh, a zip drive, the hundred meg zip drives. That's, that's what we were trying to use. So, you know, it was, it was an exploratory period, but then later in my life, I found myself needing to learn Maya. So I'm like, okay, cool. A lot of the principles that I learned before helped the learning curve, but it still was a big learning curve to, you know, to, to right. get the hang of. Um, after a few years, my, just my responsibilities no longer required me to use that. Um, fast forward another like seven years, suddenly I need to use Max again. And I'm like, oh man, okay. Let me learn at least to, to learn what I need to do for this job. You know, at that point, it was like more like scene layout and light setups and stuff like that, um, retopologizing and, and things. And then I didn't use it for a few more years. And now um, I'm in a position now where I'm working with a group of artists, uh, four or five artists that um, we're trying to build things. Uh, in this case, we're working with Maxon and we're using um, Cinema 4D. So I wasn't. I essentially wasn't happy with some of the assets that were available for um, really for stock footage and things like that for teaching visual effects. So I went and I grabbed a, I started teaching myself how to use a, a black magic camera, uh, threw that on the gimbal, started filming stuff for my students and was like, oh man, I got to pair this with the visual effects side. And as much as Yoshi has been incredibly generous with his time and all of my requests, I'm like, I cannot keep asking him for every thing that I need. So um, in the spirit of, again, being self-sufficient, uh, it was earlier last year, I started, or actually later uh, in fall of last year, I started teaching myself uh, Cinema 4D with Redshift. I'm still in like the baby steps of that. So it, ironically, it gives me um, something that I can uh, relate with my students because as they're diving into Nuke, that for me at this point feels like there's a lot of things that I take for granted because I utilize it every day that are concepts that need to be given time and practice. Um, and at the same time, when I'm also trying to expand my horizons and feeling those same frustrations, like uh, I was telling my students, like I get it when you follow the tutorial and it looks like you did everything exactly the same. Maybe you missed a checkbox somewhere, maybe you didn't, but somehow your output is completely different and you're trying to figure out why. And they're like, yes. I'm like, well, luckily, you know, when they have that problem with Nuke, I can walk them through it. But to be able to relate um, and to know that regardless of where you are in your career, to still be learning and to still be vulnerable enough to admit that there's something you don't know and that you want to expand your horizons on, um, I think helps a lot of people who are just starting out yeah. you know you you touched on something there the 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 ability to admit that you're wrong or that, that you don't know something yeah wow what a valuable <laughs> um thing to know and to understand about yourself is that you don't know everything oh yeah and that i mean oh my god that's one of the things where it's like i seriously don't understand the internet sometimes <laughs> because it's like, to me, I always try to equate anybody's job or anybody's like, you know, I've had voice actors, directors on mm -hmm. the show. I mean, all kinds from every aspect of production because I love, I love all of it. Yeah. That's one of the things that's always like, yeah, the people that you want to work with are the people that are cool and they, they can admit that they did something wrong and they're going to fix it or they're going to, you know, Hey, I, I really screwed this up, but I'm really going to try hard not to do it next time. Yeah. All of those lessons I learned in retail, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like you, yeah. it's like all of these things are, are kind of universal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I just, I, no, I love I, that. It's, it's something I'm always making those yeah. connections. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I had the fortune of learning under, uh, I, I went to the art Institute in San Diego. Um, I had, a, I had, a, I butted heads a lot with the school and with, what my expectations of what we as students should be getting out of it. Um, so myself and my wife were amongst the students who were very, very vocal and would, we were just, we'd do things on our own if we had to. Um, but we are also supported by some uh, incredible faculty that we had there. The instructors that were there, um, I, I can't say that this was across the board, but there, man, during my time there, 
there was like a small handful and like less than I could count on my hands, uh, on my fingers that were just invaluable. Um, among them were uh, Deb Miller, uh, Eric Van Hammersfeld and Floyd Bishop. And so if any of them, if this makes out to them, hey, shout out to you guys. Um, you guys have definitely stuck with us this whole time. But um, in this case, I remember Mr. Van, we used to call him, um, he, he pointed out to us not uh, that, well, at this point he was teaching, he was my 2D animation teacher. And um, he was telling us that like, yeah, it's great to have a goal, a direction, something that you can shoot for because every day you have to work towards it. But if you think it's gonna be an A to B line, you're kidding yourself. He's like, it literally is a bee line. Have you watched a bee fly before? You know, <laughs> and that was how we compared a lot of career paths. Um, it, to case in point, in that same conversation, he brought up. I think Disney had a new vice president uh, within the animation department. I can't remember the specifics, but this person had come in through a completely different industry, and became you know a prominent person within that company um, that was able to have an impact. Um, other people who uh, were animators who were asked to do something else and found that they were good at it or that maybe nobody else had the patience for it or X, Y, or Z reasons sometimes end up in a different career than they expect. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that, that concept that it's going to just be A to B uh, is, is, is not always realistic. But as you go along those paths, like you were talking about learning those lessons in retail, yeah, absolutely. Doesn't matter where you learn the lesson from, but it's the lessons, the valuable part. That's the important right. part, you know. Um, and you know that can that can go to a certain extent uh, when it comes to learning technical things, uh, because like I said before, uh, having understood either one program or a language and trying to learn the fundamentals more than just okay, I press this button and that does that, um, it allowed allowed me to shorten the learning curve on anything else that was similar whenever I had to update my skill set. So that still continues. I'm not saying it's not still a lot of work. Like I said, there's still yeah. a lot of frustration just like anything else. But um, I think what sets a lot of uh, a lot of people apart when it comes to uh, this industry is is punching through that last wall of getting that last that last five percent. Um, we keep joking that like a lot of tutorials will get you to 90% and that's it. Um, and usually when everything goes right. Um, but the difference between something that looks kind of like amateurish, but still good is trying to get that, trying to care about that last little bit of detail about, well, okay, let's see, the director needed us to, uh, add more clouds, which is going to lower everything else and starken the exposure, I guess we're going to have to, sh you know, lower the specular highlights on this robot. Something as simple as trying to match that attention to detail of, of no longer going, how does this technically work within the program, but thinking, how does this work within the world? Why, what would make sense in starting to learn how to view the world? That's what sets apart, I think, an amateur hobbyist uh, from a professional, but at the same time, not to say that there aren't some amazing, uh, like non-professionals that do some stuff on the side that like, I, again, I, I don't claim to be better than anybody out there at all. That's, I, I guess like my thing is, is that whatever I'm doing, like, I don't know, I'm really bad at learning basics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I want to get to the end. Yes. You know what I mean? It's like, I just want to, I just want to do the thing that I want to do. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of times you can't get there without learning. It's like learning that it's whatever, t whatever program you're using, you've got to learn mm -hmm. the tools first and you've got to learn where they are, where they're located, all that stuff. So you can recall mm -hmm. them when you go, okay, I need something that's going to pull this, this surface this way. Sure. You need to know what tool to use to do that or whatever. Yeah. I don't know, I'm talking out of my ass. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, no, I, I, I get what you mean, though. But yeah, yeah. But, but to that though, I think that it's 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 less of a matter of um, because I'm telling you, I fall into that same uh, mentality sometimes, where you're like, man, I just want to do the cool stuff, you know? Um, yeah. And that uh, that affects me in a lot of different aspects of my life. Trust me. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I think that you're right. Um, there isn't a 
that you're, you're definitely not wrong on that. However, there's the different steps of a thousand iterations of going, okay, I tried it that way and it went wrong. And I tried it that way and it went wrong. And then eventually you get something that works consistently or works um, uh, to get the result that you want. Um, so that is part of that practice. Like some of my students are like, man, this is really hard. I'm trying to teach them how to roto and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, it's painstaking. It is time consuming. You learn how to get better and you learn how to get faster. It literally is just practice because over time, yeah, you can learn from people as much as possible. And that's going to, again, shorten that learning curve. But without getting in there and doing it and making that mistake and making, finding out why something is, I tell people that you can learn a technique until you are like the perfect expert at it, but that doesn't make you uh, like a senior artist, uh, at least in visual effects um, for compositing. Um, usually I try to describe that seniority that comes with that leadership. It doesn't come in the form of, I know how to get it right. I know how to do exactly this. It comes in the form of this person going, okay, this is an approach and I know how soon to go, this isn't gonna work. Or I know how to consider the approaches and go, all right, I've already tried these 10. And for this thing, I know like six of these are just not gonna cut it down to four. Before I even started, I've gotten a bunch of trial and error out of the way. And when you come to a problem, you can apply that same experience. And again, right. that experience comes from simply doing it, making the mistakes or learning from other people's mistakes via mentorship, reading books or doing tutorials and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I wanted to go back to something because you had you had mentioned that you know you, you had started this club mm -hmm. in high in high school, right? Yeah. Did you did you always have like a an artistic background where you were always like drawing things and is that how you started kind of being interested in this kind of field or? Um. Yes, I would say yeah. Yeah. I don't think I had a. I don't think I had the greatest artistic um, ability, especially. Uh, I, I was surrounded by some friends who like they could paint you a mural, like a gorgeous mural at like age like 14. And I was the guy who was more into trying to create the concepts. I was trying to create, you know, all right, I'm going to make a jet that, you know, draw the jet. Okay. And it, uh, I don't know, it has, yeah, of course it has like, rockets all right cool it's got missiles and stuff right but it also shoots acid for some reason and like you know i i just figure out like the creative uh possibilities for it and i just like the potential of it um it wasn't until i started getting into uh, ironically i think into uh, more like pushing pixels as yoshi put it that that kind of started um uh clicking in my brain um, I did do a lot of stuff in high school that was more um, artistically oriented. I always, every single uh, year, I tried to make sure I took some sort of uh, either sculpting or painting or something like that. Um, and that was just because I wanted to feed that side of that creativity, but I didn't really have as much of an outlet at, at home. Um, sometimes it was just uh, through lack of resources or materials um, or just knowing who to turn to about like that kind of thing because um i don't think i had anybody in my family immediate immediate family that was uh like openly more artistic at, at that time that i saw um later i found out again through communication god forbid i talked to people that like oh yeah you know i write i draw blah 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 this and that and i'm like ah oh, wish i'd known that you know so right. long ago yeah well the I don't know. I just, I find it fascinating that, okay, so you, you, you drew, you know, just, I think most kids draw, right? Yeah. yeah. You draw, then you get into kind of this 3D thing. And then yeah. I assume at that point after high school, you went to the Marines. Yeah. So it was definitely, um, there was definitely a series of events um, that, that took place. I had applied to a school that was out in Arizona that had a 3D program. I definitely wanted to pursue this. Uh, so I knew that at that time, um, but I wasn't entirely sure exactly um, if that, that being the only option was the reason, good enough of a reason for me to go. Um, and at the time I had gotten involved um, with uh, some recruiters who had come to the high school. Um, I had 
uh, I was in much, much better shape back then. Um, but back then it was just, I, I just, I don't know. I never had a mentality to kind of like half-ass anything. So when I started uh, freshman year, I started taking like gym in the mornings and stuff like that. Like I went and actually worked out, you know, I actually went and pushed myself and sometimes I pushed myself a little bit too hard, but um, that got me into a condition that I had, <laughs> I had a little bit of, not a rivalry, but I had a little run in with one of the recruiters. Um, I think it was my sophomore year. Um, because they had some event where they brought out some pull-up bar and they're like, oh yeah, you know, you do X number of pull-ups and we'll give you this prize and had all these tiers and stuff like that. And, um, and I wanted, I wanted a hat, I wanted this, uh, this like baseball cover that they had. And I was like, Hey, I want, I want the hat. And it's like, okay, get up and do 20. I'm like, All right. And at that time I weighed very little and I had been working out for like two years straight and I got up there and I busted out 20 pull-ups and like, I was like, all right, and he got kind of annoyed and he like threw a t-shirt at me and I was like, no, I wanted I wanted the hat. And he's like, fine, do another 20. So I get up there and I was like, da, da, da. <laughs> and they're like proper, you know, all the way like locked elbow all the way down. And otherwise the Marines wouldn't have counted it. And I got down and I was like, give me the hat. And the sergeant came over and he's like, hey, how old are you? I was like, 16. He's like, he's like, all right, well, legally I can't talk to you till you're 17. So here, take my card and we'll just, we'll talk later. I was like, okay. So a few months rolled by and like on my 17th birthday, they were like parked outside and, you know, <laughs> I, I met them. They were absolutely fantastic. Um, at that point, I had already been talking to the Navy, had already kind of been looking into a military career. Um, and um, long story short, um, I ended up uh, doing, uh, I joined in the delayed entry program for about a, about a year, um, basically until I, I graduated. And then I spent the summer right after graduation, I went and visited family for that summer and then um, came back in August and shipped off to boot camp. But um, so my senior year, I did kind of my senior project on the Marines in general. So I did a year's worth of just research into the culture, into the customs, into the history, um, into conflicts, into just um, the things that were going to be expected, not just for me uh, trying to make it to boot camp, but like what was the Marine Corps about in general? So um, my, I think it was my senior year. I think it, I can't remember if it was, uh, I think it was the very beginning of my senior year. It's when um, um, September 11th happened in 2001. So that sort of cemented my decision to enlist. Um, I didn't know what I was going to be able to bring um, during that year in delayed entry. Um, I had been talking to the recruiter and we'd been talking about my MOS and things like that. Um, so I ended up um, uh, enlisting, and during that time, um, I ended up deploying. Uh, I did uh, uh, five rotations out in Iraq, um, but I still kept more of a somewhat of a connection to an artistic uh, part of the culture. Um, I was often tasked with um, either painting murals, or people would be like, "Hey, we want a T-shirt designed," or you know, just small things like that. Hey, we need. The, the battalion has a new coin and we need to design that blah, blah blah and it was just like it really came down to like i was the only guy who knew photoshop like that was right <laughs> it was really through not much else than, than than that um because like i said there were definitely some amazing artists that were there always just creating these beautiful illustrations and um i just envied that ability and i knew that that was also practice um but uh yeah, so I still kept that um, through the military. And as I got better at Photoshop, I started compositing um, people. Like, I guess it was like before memes were a thing. I started putting people in our unit. And I don't know, at one point, I think I put like like one of our staff sergeant's faces on, a, on a, what's her face, on Paris Hilton uh, from a magazine ad or something like that. And, you know, just printing it out and like conspicuously leaving it somewhere for everybody to find. And, you know, I think everybody knew it was me, but nobody like <laughs> knew it was me. <laughs> so just like little things like that, you know, just to kind of have that levity in those stressful situations and those stressful environments sure. um, definitely helped. Um, so um, at that point, I I was already kind of getting into this aspect where I I enjoyed kind of giving back and teaching um, those who had come uh, after me and kind of were newer. You know, I was the one in charge of training 
the new uh, anybody who was like checking into our unit. Um, then later I became a platoon sergeant. So I was kind of in charge of actual like official training for our unit um, as well as well-being and like personnel. Like it was kind of a weird mix between HR and like, uh, I don't want to say like therapy, but like it was like I had to chew someone's ass if they didn't go to their dentist appointment. So it was kind of weird, like, you know, not to say that anybody needed that kind of that level of care, but it was within my purview to make sure that yeah. everybody was, was prepared physically, emotionally, and, and, and mentally. Um, so I started, I went and became a martial arts instructor and became, uh, started training with my unit. Um, and I really wanted to do that uh, long term. Um, I was, I really enjoyed it. Um, in 2004, during uh, uh, my second deployment, uh, it was actually my, uh, yeah, my second time out, I ended up um, injuring, getting injured with a, a mortar blast that ended up knocking me off a ledge. And long story short, uh, I crushed all the cartilage in my right ankle uh, and kind of jammed the bones together and um, didn't get that operated on until like three years later. Um, so I actually ended up having another deployment in between that. Um, so I was like in a, in a, what's called a cam walker. So one of those like plastic boots with the Velcro. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, at, at one point, um, I had to uh, deploy just because of the role that I had there. Um, I was leading an eight-person team, and we were just uh, basically maintaining communications and uh, radio equipment between three major cities uh, in Iraq. Um, so they're like, "Yeah, just try to you know stay off your foot. You'll be fine. Just put a you know just wrap it, and uh, yeah, if it swells up too bad, just take take motor and change your socks." You know. Um, so I ended up deploying uh, in uh, in in uh, in 2006, um, the last time. And at that point, again, I was like basically in charge of those three location sites, uh, with my team and, um, uh, they're like, okay, cool. Well, again, try to stay off of it. So instead, luckily I didn't have to go on any more convoys, but I was getting picked up and dropped off via helicopter every two weeks for a different location movement. And I'm like, all right. So I did that for another seven months. Um, finally came back and got that operated on. And, um, you know, it just, it made me just reconsider, uh, along with some other events that had taken place, um, just, you know, how many close calls I had. I don't know how many, how many of my nine lives I had cashed in, but I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, excited to keep trying to find out. Um, so while I was, uh, I, I ended up getting stop lost, which is basically where Uncle Sam goes, hey, I know your contract's up, but we need you enough to not let you go for a while. So I got stop loss for 13 months and uh, um, ended up staying um, for just over five years at that point uh, total of active duty. Um, and at the very least during that time, I thought I need to think about what's ahead. So at that time I was at the station at Camp Pendleton. And so I, that's where I found artists to San Diego because they were, they were relatively close by, something that I could actually commute to. So. Um, for my like <clears throat> the last almost the last year of my active duty service, I would uh, twice a week I would finish work or I'd leave uh, if I needed to maybe an hour early so that I could beat traffic because um, it was one of those weird situations where like for every minute later you leave it's another ten minutes you're gonna sit at a certain spot so um, so yeah I you know I'd, I'd, I'd work a full day and then go to class and we do I think there were four hour classes and then I'd drive back and. And I do that for the whole year, um, just try to get a, get a head start and make sure that that was where I wanted to put my resources. Um, while I was on active duty, there was a different set of resources that was available that wouldn't utilize my GI Bill. So it allowed me to uh, try it out, you know, see what that expectation was of what was expected for the student and the outcome and, and kind of see if that's where I wanted to go back to. And ultimately it, it really was. Um, I ended up um, getting a job offer right after I left the, the military by my counterparts. Um, I used to do a lot of work with um, uh, as a as a liaison for some uh, with Raytheon, Oshkosh, and a bunch of other. Um, they're essentially just like uh, repair companies, you know, stuff like that, and doing maintenance on, on equipment and stuff. Um, and then they offered me a position, basically, the liaison that I was working with was being promoted out of the position. And they're like, hey, we can't think of anyone better. Would you like this position? And it was literally like 
offered to me and I was like, man, that is awesome. Like I'd be on the civilian side, don't have to deal with all the crazy stuff, but I'd love to still work with Marines. And I don't know if I mentioned that was, it was in Del Mar, which is uh, a part of Pendleton that is literally 50 yards from the beach. So <laughs> it's right. like, man. And I thought, no, I need to, I need to, I need to stick with the plan. I need to stick with what I, I really want to do and what makes sense to me. Um, so I, you know, politely declined the offer and, um, you know, they were, you know, they're awesome about it. And, um, I still, you know, talk to them to, you know, sometimes these days, especially through social media and stuff, but, um, yeah, it was, it was a hard decision and a scary one, but at the same time back then it was just me. I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have a, a fiance or a wife. Um, now I have um, first child coming along on the way in June. Um, my wife and I are very excited. Um, and we've still made a bunch of big leaps since then. Um, you know, we, she and I met at school and um, we instantly clicked and we had very similar goals. We were to a certain extent a thorn in the, uh, the administration side because we were always the ones going like, what the hell, why aren't we doing this? Or where's, you know, is the money getting spent on that and blah, blah, blah. And like, hey, there's this event that's happening. We want to make sure that the school gets involved or, you know, they're giving away this free software to any schools. Why isn't that getting brought here? Um, so we were always there. Um, and ultimately with the help of those instructors that I've mentioned before, Deb Miller and um, Eric Van Hammersfeld, um, we ended up joining a nonprofit group called Women in Animation. And it was a networking group um, that uh, had actually become so successful and popular that um, uh, uh, men started wanting to join. And by the time you know uh, I had gotten involved with it, um, we, about a third of the, mem of the members were male. Um, and again, it had absolutely fantastic benefits as far as networking and that representation in the animation industry. Um, so we joined forces with them and essentially every quarter we would charter our own bus and we would drive a bunch of students. We would, every student would pitch in 40 bucks and we would, um, we'd set up meetings and we'd drive ourselves to Los Angeles and we'd meet two companies. Um, we, we talked to, uh, Disney animation. We went and we talked to, uh, Sony. We talked to rhythm and cues. We talked to DreamWorks out in Glendale. Um, I mean, just all this company, Nickelodeon was like more than like super welcoming. And it was like a bus of like 30 of us. And every single time they're just like, please just let us know you're coming and we'll go. I think we ended up going to Disney. I lost count how many times. Um, and even there, it was amazing because we'd be walking through the hall and like Glenn King would just stop and say hi and then teach us something for an hour just out of his day. Um, uh, Eric Goldberg too, one day he was walking by and, uh, for those who don't know, Eric Goldberg, um, he's probably animated. He's, he's the lead animator on probably most of the characters that you might recognize, like the, the genie from Aladdin or, you know, Louis from, um, the princess frog. And at that time, that's what he had been working on. He had just been coming off of that. So he pulled us into this little side room with a, a projector. And he was like, let me show you my thought process on how I went around designing these characters. And like, again, just out of their day unexpectedly, um, just took the time to answer questions. And, and that was kind of the general experience that we had where we would basically say, all right, students, who do you want to talk to? Uh, are you looking to be a compositor? Are you looking to be a writer, director? Um, you know, what field are you trying to get into? Are you trying to get into the production side? And we trying to line up conversations with uh, people from those uh, from those departments, um, and again, that was like without the support of the school, and they get kind of cross about that. But I mean, what are you going to take away from us? Like that. I mean, that's amazing. Just gold. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so we we did that, and um, and then there we again at the school we we started another club um, with our own mentorship. Uh, I think we called it the Animation Alchemist or something. Everything had to have a cool catchy name, but um, <laughs> it was just a bunch of students who were very passionate, uh, mentoring each other and things that were going on in the in the industry and little things about hey I learned about this technique or I learned about this cool way to like I think one day we talked about taking fictional characters and breaking them down. Uh, figuring out what their skeletons would actually look like, because that would actually help us figure out how they would move, even if they 
you know, we had like the, the skeleton of like the Powerpuff Girls at one point or a Tweety Bird and this and that, you know, we brought in a lot of examples and we're like, you know, how would that help us understand how we utilize this character? You know? Yeah. So, yeah. That is so awesome. And, and I will say that's one of the things that I've noticed because, um, let's see, you're, I think you're my third visual effects artist I've had on the show. Okay. Um, Miguel, I don't know if you know Miguel yes. Guerrero. Yeah, uh, I don't know him. However, I did watch his interview with you, and that was absolutely fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, he's he's just amazing. Um, yeah. But one of the things that I find this really interesting this this concept of in visual effects, there seems to be this openness and this generosity mm-hmm. amongst peers. Yeah. And on the other side, the like actual filming side that doesn't happen it seems like everybody <laughs> feel like i know what i know and no one yes. else can know it you know and again there are definitely some exceptions to the rules but i have i have noticed that kind of divide and um uh, i was actually talking to, to a good friend of mine um recently that um we've been collaborating uh more recently who's an editor and he he was like i wonder if it's because usually on a project there's like one editor maybe an assistant and it's more of a uh, a singular sort of task a lot of times yeah. versus um t- uh, you know a task that is more like i mentioned earlier so team oriented um that there is is so much more uh looked at of like okay what's going to help the production as a whole and not just like what's going to make things look better or look cooler sometimes the effort goes into what's going to get us the exact same result we're shooting for, but that's going to make sure we all get home on time, but not compromise quality. You know, that, you know, that, you know, mother's, uh, was it, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And that Hmm. is that necessity also spurs that collaborate, that, that collaborative spirit. Yeah. Because, um, I try to tell my students this all the time. I'm like, don't hold yourself to, uh, these finished products that have probably had dozens of artists contributing dozens, if not hundreds of hours in order to get it to look that way. Um, And Mm -hmm. at the same time, like make sure you follow the fundamentals because that kind of work you are able to accomplish, but it's gonna take that work, that amount of time to make sure that you hit those details. And um, really the most thing, the most part is to try to work smarter and not harder. It is such a huge uh, part of this industry that wherever um, things can be done more efficiently, absolutely go for it. Because again, that not only usually results in better uh, quality, but at the same time, which the biggest struggle I think for a lot of visual effects artists is to maintain that work-life balance. Um, Not only for the reasons of sometimes production schedules can be super hefty, but also there's that creep factor, meaning like, because you also enjoy it. You also find yourself at like you know, two in the morning going, oh, let me, maybe if I tweak that on this render, let me go try this real quick, or maybe this will get the result that I want. And then um, trying to make sure that you balance that out. You know, <laughs> I was gonna say that that's one of the things that I've noticed when I'm doing, uh, it's really editing. For me, editing is one of those things that can be, uh, and I'm talking about <clears throat> my stupid crap, not, not anything important, but you know, my, my movies and things like I will, I will sit there and, and be just tweaking things and, Oh, I like, I like the way that flows better or whatever. And then I'll look up and I'm like, it's four hours later (laughs) and I was supposed to do this thing, you know, I mean, just, so I I assume that it would be the same with, with your line of work too. I mean, you just get lost in it sometimes. Yes, you can, you can get lost in it. And, um, before I continue with anything else, I want to say that no, your work is not any less uh, is not any any more or less important. I'm telling you, um, especially you're sitting there and you're 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 like you said you're tweaking it for four hours. The reason that you're doing that, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, is because you're trying to make sure that you're getting exactly the message you're trying to get out across. Right. And a lot of times that's the same thing that we're trying to do with the team of people and trying to do a lot of times with whatever the director's vision is, but having that visual language and the understanding for it, um, is that's the, that's the skill. You know, a lot, a lot of people like look at some things that, uh, maybe some, like, I, uh, maybe on adult swim that it's 
kind of designed to look like kind of like crappy or a certain style or this and that. And I'm like, no, you have no idea how hard it is <laughs> to pull that off. You know, um, I saw recently there was a, a post on LinkedIn where somebody uh, created a, uh, what was it? It was a googly eye deformer that you can attach to your models in Unreal. And so as your character would run around, mm. googly eyes would act like physical googly eyes. And it was absolutely hysterical. It was whimsical. And then like looking at the breakdown of the amount of know-how that had to go into doing that. So don't sell yourself short. Like you're definitely doing something that takes skill, that takes dedication and that nobody can get your message across better than you can. So right. it, yeah, it makes sense that you would want to make sure you you get exactly that. I appreciate that. But I mean, I just don't feel like, uh, you know, when I'm reviewing <laughs> some ridiculous movie that, or what, it, just whatever it is, I don't think it's, it's nearly as gotcha. important. And, and I also am aware that the reason that I have to spend so many hours doing it is because I didn't prepare my script the right way. <laughs> so then everything I'm talking about is out of order. So I'm having to yep. pull from yep. over here. So yeah I, yeah, I say that with the, uh, <laughs> yeah, without you I definitely know, that. I definitely know what you mean. My, <laughs> my wife, uh, uh, again, she was putting some of her writing knowledge into her YouTube channel. And, um, again, when she, um, uh, became a little bit more, um, preoccupied with their current priorities, we, uh, you know, she took a break from it, but yeah, the script and her like pre-planning, but I mean, that same thing applies in, in visual effects and uh, filmmaking. It's like, Really, the more you pre-plan, the better it's going to go along, right. along the lines, you know. So yeah, usually I, I I am definitely getting better, but um, yeah, I do have my days where it's just <laughs> like, okay, what was I thinking? I couldn't just sit down and talk about this. Yeah, I've got to freaking yeah. work it out. <laughs> but I also I wanted to say, that. um, Eagle Ford and Vicky, uh, they're longtime supporters. Uh, Eagle Ford is actually my dad. Oh, um, he said, thank nice. you. Thank you for taking care of all of us earlier. I just wanted to make sure I said that, um, to you. Um, oh, much appreciated. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's, it's one of those things where like I have, gosh, talk about Marines. I think you're my third Marine that I've had on, on the show too. So, so yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so I have some questions here. Sure. And we can you can spend as much or as little time as you want on these. But these are questions mm -hmm. that I asked uh, on my Discord. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my, famously one of my uh, my greatest supporters, he's from New Zealand. He could be a little trolly sometimes. Okay. But uh, there, I think there's some actually good questions in here. But <clears throat> so the first question was, what kind of adjustments to your work schedule environment or prospects did the pandemic force on you <clears throat> oh man um whew, it's kind of like what didn't it ever, and nothing is the same period across the board um when we had to go into the lockdown um i remember probably just because it was a memorable date it was a friday the 13th this march mm -hmm. 13th um, was the last day that i commuted home and um luckily we uh, at the company that i was at it was um, this company called phosphine out in new york um our IT team of, uh, of two amazing, incredible people were able to pivot um, while they were already kind of anticipating, because again, they were very forward thinking, uh, very forward thinking department. Um, they were kind of anticipating and testing out just the possibilities of these kinds of um, remote uh, workstations and stuff like that. Um, so when we had to go into lockdown, I think we were back up and running by like Monday like Monday or Tuesday at the latest um, for the most of us. Uh, and for that, it meant getting used to some interesting, um, not just the technological side of communicating via video and again, getting used to um, Zoom. And at that time we were using this uh, software hardware, Teradici to remote into our computers mm. um, at, at there so that uh, we were less reliant on what kind of hardware we had individually. Um, so that helped, um, but the aspect of not being there in person really impacted, I think, a lot of the creative, a lot of the organizational, and a lot of the communication. Um, it was just a lot of things that I think we took for granted um, in person are now things that you have to schedule or find time for or make sure that they don't get lost in the shuffle of all the other things that used to not have to be an email. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and so that balance was very difficult to strike. 
Um, for me personally, uh, during the pandemic, um, I had several uh, incidences in the, in the family, some tragedies in the family that um, had impacted me, as well as some um, health issues of my own. So um, between that and still trying to get used to not commuting and not like, I don't, I don't know, like the, being able to work remotely and what that meant. Um, sometimes that meant I ended up working longer hours because it was easy for me to. Um, right. Sometimes I was so burnt out that I had so much trouble concentrating on things. And I know at that time in that schedule, it was so crazy because we, uh, my, my team and I were kind of coming off of two back-to-back -back difficult um, scope projects, you know, some of the larger projects the company had had. Um, and everybody absolutely just brought their A game. And towards the end, we were just running on, on fumes, um, especially like some of our, our the effects supervisors um, who did a tremendous job. And man, I just cannot even fathom how they physically had the endurance um, to, to take on some of these jobs. Um, but um, they absolutely did a, an amazing job. Um, but yeah, we had that goal in mind, that light at the end of the tunnel. And they're like, man, yeah, we're going to push through this. Um, the projects we're working on at that point, and I don't say we, but the, the supervisor that I was working with, um, they were finishing up um, Escape at Danamora, um, who the lead on that was uh, Joe Bergatti. I, I think he got nominated for an Emmy for that, if I'm not mistaken. For, for which um, one? Which I'm is, sorry. Uh, Escape, at, uh, Escape at Danamora. Oh, uh, and that was a uh, that I've was a, that. Uh, a limited series that was based off of uh, it was actually an event. Uh, it was only like maybe five six years ago, I think, where um, there's a prison in upstate New York where um, that there was two convicts that, with the help of a guard, ended up escaping, and there's this huge manhunt across New York, PA, and Jersey, hmm. and uh, they ended up turning that into a limited series. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're working on on that, and then. Um, we're coming off of uh, Plot Against America, which was uh, based off of um, the uh, Philip K. Dick's uh, novel. I think I got that name right. Again, I'm terrible with names. No, yeah, that's... Okay, thank you. Good. Yeah. Um, so we had come off of that, and that was a, a limited series as well. Um, and we were doing some, uh, some great work on that. But again, we we're kind of just pushing through. It was one of the few places where it felt... Um, when we got into these tight spots, it never felt like, oh, it's because someone messed up or some of the schedule, blah, blah, blah. It was just everybody was, you know, to a certain extent transparent and everybody's very supportive. And it really had that feeling of, you know, we're all in it together. Um, so it made that push to the quote unquote light at the end of the tunnel where we're going to take, you know, some time off and try to, you know, um, you know, at least for us individually, try to slow down. And, you know, we'd already been talking with, production to try to, you know, make that, like work that into the schedule for us and everything. And, uh, you know, that pandemic hit and then it turned into, all right, we need to kind of make sure that things are still running and still going. And, you know, a lot of trial and error um, with everybody's roles and what that meant and how those were carried out. So um, that adjustment was, um, was difficult. So it kind of, you know, for, for that particular period of time, man, it was just, um, it was like, all right, cool. We're pushing through, pushing through. And then you get blindsided by a global level event that further just kind of takes the wind out of you, you know? Yeah. So, um, being able to, to kind of figure out all of that, um, as you go along and having the support, uh, from, you know, I, I never felt any kind of pressure from, you know, the company or the clients that we're working for that, like, anything was out of like, we're not doing something well enough. Like, you know, like as far as this kind of thing, it was uh, very, again, supportive and collaborative. And I think that without that, uh, I don't know, it would have probably gotten, gotten a lot worse. Um, I know lately it's been very different because uh, again, even though we definitely had a great relationship, um, the reality is that because of the pandemic production schedules were all over the map. Yeah. Um, some, you know, so um, one of the results of that uh, at one point was, you know, I ended up parting ways with the company and um, I ended up taking some time off. Um, it, it felt like they were a class act from like the day I stepped foot in there to my last day 
uh, virtually. So, you know, definitely thank you and hats off to everybody, everybody there. Um, you know, after that, I, I just, I took some time off and it was the first time in a very, very long time. Um, I had been staff at, at that company for four years. And before that, I was um, a supervisor and department manager at another company uh, for three years of staff. And the break in between those two jobs was the weekend. So I ended up last day of one job on Friday and picked up the next one that Monday. And it was the first time that I really stopped. And I just, I wasn't gonna try to network. I wasn't gonna try to work on my reel. I just wanted to take stock and, and, and try to rest. And luckily we, my wife and I were in a situation where I finally had the opportunity to stop, you know? Um, so certain things like student loans were like starting to drop off. Um, little things, not, not, that was little, that was not a little yeah. thing, but other little things um, throughout that were these big challenges that we had been like coming to the end of a long-term plan. And those things were starting to pay off was actually starting to buy us some breathing room too. So that was probably the single most valuable thing about that long-term plan that we had, um, both financially and career-wise, was to be able to take that whole month off. As weird as that sounds, yeah. and be able to feel at peace about it. You know, um, so after that, I kind of started, uh, you know, this last year reassessing what it is that I wanted to do, and. Um, I started again getting more involved with training and mentorship and nonprofits within our industry, um, just trying to um, trying to give back. Uh, I joined a group, uh, full-time filmmakers, as well as another uh, their other course creators group, um, with the intent of kind of taking all the lessons learned that I had and trying to put them to use. And one of the things in there really struck uh, stuck with me, which was that like if you consider yourself, I see on a scale of one to 10 within your industry, uh, skill-wise or knowledge-wise, uh, say a six, and you're not the best, well, that's fine. Everybody with a skill set of five through one is going to benefit from everything that you have. And eventually, you're going to move to you know, the next skill yeah. level, whatever that might be for you, and you're going to have more to get back. So it's never too early to you know, give back and train those that are, you know, a few steps behind you. And you'd be surprised how much you learn just by doing that. How much you retain just by doing that. Yeah. I, and it's one of the, like me, I'm, I don't know. I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. I, I kind of feel like in a lot of ways, but, but there's been, uh, there's been times just on this stream when it's the most, it's, when somebody asks a question and you're able to answer it and they go, well, thank you. Thank you for that. And you can tell that they, they get it. Mm -hmm. I love teaching. It's one of the things that I, and it's probably why I'm, I talk too much, but um, <laughs> it's, but it's one of those things where it's like, for me, it's so rewarding, you know? And yeah, I, I just, I love that. So yeah, I, it's, yeah, we're, we're definitely yeah. on the same page there. It's, it's very, very, it's not only, it's not only rewarding, you get something out of it, but, I like seeing the, their, the light in their eyes when they go, yeah. oh, I get it. And you're like, yeah, ha -ha, yeah. 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 yeah you know? it's awesome. Yeah. And it's been really inspirational to see, um, uh, not necessarily students, but like a lot of times when I was uh, a mid-level artist or a senior level artist, I'd be teaching the juniors and seeing the junior artists that I once taught like the very basics of something suddenly is like, hey, they're the head of a department now or like they're, they're, they're like the head of production and they're doing this on their own and like, it just, oh man, it just fills me with, uh, with a lot of joy to see that, you know? It's um, funny how like, okay, so game chasers wise, right? Uh -huh. Billy and Jay, they both worked for me at Blockbuster. Uh -huh. So I was and but Billy, I've, I'd known, I've known Billy since he was 16. Oh wow. And he was, I was his manager at Kroger when he was 16 years old. Oh, is, wow. So now I was working for him. He, he's the director of the Game Chasers movie. <laughs> and I'm basically kind of his employee. And I'm just saying, hey, what can I do? What, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And he's like, hey, I want you to do this and this, whatever. Yeah. It's it's crazy how yeah. I love that too. And then, uh, gosh, even my last real job, 
my boss was somebody that I'd trained at another company. <laughs> yeah. And it was, and we had a great relationship. There wasn't any like ego there or anything mm -hmm. like that. So oh, absolutely. it's, it's, I love that. It's, it's, yeah. it is really, really cool. Yeah. Um, so kind of the, to touch back on the question, I want to say that oh, um, yeah. not only was changing everything through the pandemic, changing my approach to work, uh, my time management, uh, the technology, um, the social interactions, all of that was uh, hugely impacted. Um, but more so, I think the big thing that I noticed not in myself alone, but in a lot of other people is that um, people through, again, necessity started to not necessarily reinvent themselves, but kind of figure out another avenue at which they can approach to either make a living or to add to maybe something that helps them with their brand, right? Like, <laughs> so I think that spirit of what else can I do? What else am I capable of? Um, was brought out and not just myself, but a lot of people. Um, and, and, you know, they said that after the, after the, the play came the Renaissance and I can see and hope you know, I can see why and hope that that is that exactly what what that is that people don't um, lose that sense of curiosity and that sense of pursuing something for the sake of seeing if it'll work because you want to because right. at the same time you know there's a much more precarious situation in which we have to like take other things into consideration but the spirit there of how to do it the smart the smart way you know and yep. not just run back to whatever was there before because it was what you know everybody's forced into looking for something that they don't know if they don't know about right now you know yeah so. see and that's yeah exactly yeah. and you know what on that kind of thought process along those lines mm -hmm. is the next question from All mr right. bucho let's hear it have you ever lost a significant amount of work due to some <sighs> kind of tech malfunction also known mm -hmm. as did you have to learn the value of backing up the hard way? Um, yes, yes, and yes. Um, so <laughs> everybody's I, got a, a story like this. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, knock on wood. I personally, I have not had any hard drives fail to date, and I have some old ones. But I also kind of, I don't know. At a certain point, I'm like, I'm gonna move stuff off of this, and it's just sitting sat on the shelf. But um, I have lost a, a significant amounts of personal work from time to time, um, a lot when I was in school. Um, there are certain brands of hard drives that I, 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 you can give me all the reports, but I'm like, no, you hurt me. I done did me wrong. So I, I'm hesitant with certain ones. Who um, were those, by the way? I don't know if I should throw that out there, yeah. But um, I, look, I'm, okay, I'll say, I'll say it. Seagate cost me a lot of extra time in college. Oh my, <laughs> so much extra time. So, um, but yes, um, I did do that, uh, lose that hmm. personal stuff. Um, however, I've since become not necessarily compulsive, but I do take some extra measures. I'll back things up into more than one cloud spot as well as have, uh, I'll try to like, if I can make a hard drive that has a certain amounts of work, um, and then just put that in the closet somewhere. Yeah. Try to take put somewhere, um, and I I don't know how soon I'm gonna have to start really paying the big bucks at Dropbox because <laughs> I think I'm up to uh, close to three terabytes at that point of just the cloud backups, which is usually more of the the fundamental things, the project files rather than assets and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, definitely taking more precautions. Um, I have seen some stories. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, when I was looking for internships. We had uh, a fellow uh, student of mine who, uh, or not student of mine, but a fellow student, I was a student at the same time, um, had gotten a, uh, uh, an internship at a certain company. Uh, they made cinematics for um, certain uh, games that ran with Shmomi. And um, this person, was using this software that is utilized in the industry called shotgun that's just like a project and asset and task management and stuff like that um and if i remember correctly um this person went through and was like oh let me clean up my stuff since i don't really have anything to do right now and was like oh well this isn't mine this isn't mine this isn't mine and just started removing things thinking that he was removing it from his view or his account or something like that 
but was just deleting whole projects oh off my of God. off of the server. And um, I believe this person did keep their internship. They definitely, <laughs> I'm sure, got a talking to. Um, and it caused some significant costs to restore. You know, the it, there was obviously redundancies in place or other uh, things like that. But yes, um, things like that have happened. Um, other things that weren't as major that have happened were weird things like, um, let's see, uh, I know that at one point that one of the studios that I was working at was doing a 3D conversion for uh, the Shrek movies. And <laughs> they're like, all right, cool. Like, so this is going to be easy because we don't have to like roto things, right? You have like all the assets and we can just get like mats and like whatever we need and all this other stuff, all these, you know, depth information. And they're like, yeah, no, they kept the renders and didn't archive the assets or the working files or anything. And we're like, what? I don't know if that's still the case. Like maybe that was the thought at the time. But yeah, as by the time it came to us, we're like, we had to treat it as if it was live action, you know? Um, another thing wow. too that happened from time to time. Yeah, just the, the, the mind. Yeah, now, now there is a lot more thought that goes into archiving across the board, I'm sure, um, especially yeah. with uh, just seeing the value in that. Um, it breaks my heart going back into even animation history to think that, um, again, one of the things I learned while I was at Disney is just how many beautiful cells were wiped clean to be reused that you know, artwork never to be seen again other than the scan that took place. Um, but you know, that was kind of that same thing for digital storage, uh, I guess, during that time, during the, the mid to late yeah. 90s. Oh, we um, just reuse that hard drive. Yeah, you know, it must it must have been, but we're like, oh man, that's insane. Um, some other random things that would happen were like uh, uh, when we were doing a conversion for uh, we're doing the conversion and uh, and the visual effects compositing for um, the Transformers Three, I think it was, uh, Dark Dark of the Moon, and um, I remember uh, Michael Bay wanted to. He, he kind of wanted to keep it under wraps while we were in production that anything was being converted. And because there was a lot, a large percentage of the film that was being actually being filmed in stereoscopic 3D. Um, so that was really cool. At the same time, we're like, yo, this robot cannot be like, it's clearly we're going to be recompositing this in 3D. <laughs> but um, every now and then, every now and then, like, I don't want to say every now and then. No, I think for me personally, I was on at least one or two shots where they're like, hey, this was a big shot. A like a very principal actor was in it. And they're like, and it was shot in stereo. I'm like, okay. And they're like, and they lost one of the eyes. <laughs> what do you mean they lost one of the eyes? They're like, yeah, you know, you have a left eye and the right eye. I'm like, yeah. You have the film for both. I'm like, yes. I was like, yeah, they lost the left eye or they lost the right. So we had to recreate what wow. would have been seen there. Um, and so that was an additional kind of like interesting thing when it came to lost, lost data. I can't say that that was a, a regular thing, but it was a very like, wait, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> what do you mean you lost? But I can't be surprised that with that many moving parts that something was going to, right? Uh, you know, just the nature of, of, of that, you know. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you uh, <laughs> just real briefly back in the, the zip file days. Yeah. The uh one of my zip disks had all of my I mean this is this is what pre MP3s really. Yeah. You know what I mean? This was a this yeah. is a long time ago. So I had a lot of old letters, old emails, old just all like connection connections with people and things I mean just all of this stuff and yeah. that disk was unreadable. Yeah. Oh, and so man, it was that's... like it was like okay, I learned my lesson. Never do that again. And then of course yeah. I've had I had a uh, around that same that was what probably 97 98 something like that 99 mm -hmm. I don't know what year it was anyway I had a computer crash on me the same same sort of thing we lost everything yeah. and I'm like and, okay never again so now yeah. you know I have my I have my app I have my iMac time machine right it yeah. automatically backs up yeah. and then I back up individual files onto a separate disk yes yeah uh, I yeah I'll definitely and you know it's weird because it's it's tedious but um, it's, I am I'm happy with the peace of mind that would go with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, but yeah, I, uh, I, you know, in, in talking about that, yeah. Uh, kind of going back, 
um, yeah, when I was probably a, a senior in high school, I had this old Mac 2CI that had all of my like essays that I had written to college applications. And um, I had a short story that had been like published because it was like, uh, we, it was for an English assignment and like the teacher we didn't realize was gonna like submit all of our work and then like throw it out the wall and see what sticks. And well, one of my pieces of work got published and I'm like, that was on there, that's lost. I'm like, I had no idea what it was. Um, uh, it was something to do with like uh, I had written a scene about like a detective, like tailing uh, uh, tailing someone and like their interaction through the city or something like that. But um, yeah, it was um, yeah it was it was devastating and it was like the things that I was able to back up were important to me at that age, and now I'm like oh I should have backed up these other things instead of a bunch of dumb jpegs i'm sure i could have read down yeah, it somewhere yeah. else yeah there's some it that's that's the other thing is like if, if i can get it on the internet somewhere i don't care how big it is yeah i'm not yeah. backing it up <laughs> because it's it's just not worth it's not worth the valuable hard drive space you know yeah. i mean i sure, mean unless sure. unless you're rich and you can just afford as many lacy hard drives as you want sure but, and at the but, same yeah. time even those anything that has a like a spinning disc or even like yes. cds Oh, I learned the hard way. And that's even weirder because I'm at enough time has passed now that I can see the difference in quality between brands or between like the, you know, the, the, the $10 spindle versus the, you know, $25 spindle of the same amount. And I'm like, oh, well, these are all corroded and gone now. And these ones are, well, they need help, but you know, maybe I should, they're still able to be readable or something. You're, I can back them up or something. You know? You're making me think that I should go ahead and check because i have cds and oh yeah stuff i mean tons yeah. of those um oh, there's a weird old cd smell now i didn't know that was a thing i see i haven't <laughs> even well i mean i have an imac i don't even have a disc drive anymore I, yeah, so yeah. i have to have oh. a i have to use a uh an external disc drive if i don't need to do anything with a yeah. disc now. you know it's funny that you mentioned that um kind of that's funny story i when i was uh during my last deployment i had a I had a gunnery sergeant who he had a he he carried around with him all of his all of his family photos all of his like if you were talking about like all his personal files and stuff like that he carried them around on the four was it the 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 floppy the the uh, the hard the hard disks oh and like a really, like a one point four four meg yes oh yes god but this is two thousand and six and we we're like what and he deployed with it and everything and he's like aha he's like. Bet you it's like good luck trying to find one of these best encryption. And he had a USB to to the hard drive adapter, and it would pop up as the A drive. And he's like, you need. He's like, where are you gonna find another drive like this these days? He's like, it's the best encryption. Ever. <laughs> it's actually, I mean, and there there's kind of a brilliance to it, but at the same time, <laughs> holy crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what he did to compress things. I'm sure those things were, you know, he. he he was happy. He was happy. And again, he yeah. didn't utilize it for anything else, but yeah, he, uh, yeah. Like, and talk about, talk about <laughs> that, you know, when you're, t it, it kind of like got me thinking about all these things where you can, you know how you can, I don't know if you, I'm sure you probably had to do this at some point, but where you can, you can do it where you can, if it's a really large file, you mm -hmm. can share it over multiple CDs Yes. Yeah. and then you get into the, uh, what is it? I can't remember what the par files yeah, yeah. Well, we used to. We used it's to do a that. weird thing. I can I still can't figure out how you've got this huge archive. You and again, this was back in my uh, yeah piracy days. Yeah, yeah. But you know how like you down you only download forty parts of the fifty parts, mm -hmm. but then you download this ten megs worth of par files, and it can reconstruct what's missing. And I'm like, how is yeah. that even? That doesn't even make sense to me. <laughs> like, why yeah. isn't it just that then? I, I don't, don't I, I don't know the technical side <laughs> of that. I didn't get too much into that, but um, from what one of my friends tried to explain it to me was something to do where like, it's able, it's like something to do where that 10 megs is the instructions that kind of knows where to pull the information from something else. I don't know the specifics. I can't so speak nuts. to it, but it is, it is a crazy, but I do remember um, breaking down like um, uh, where we could break, like you can uh, put something into a RAR file. I think this is what we did it with the most. And it would break it up, regardless of what size it was, into, I don't know, you wanted it to be 10 parts or 13 yeah. parts or whatever. And then you can just put those on each on a disc. And then on the other side, um, what it would do is it would just start um, 
reopening or, you know, decompressing or extracting that part of it. And I am imagining, again, I can't speak to it. I'm not, you know, a computer science major of any sorts, um, <laughs> that it was, it kind of reminded me of like the old Final Fantasy games. Where it's like, ah, I'm done reading this information. Please, it's exactly. I now have instructions yeah. to wait for the next part, you know, and we right. go from there. But it's yeah. Great. It, that, <laughs> yeah, I, I completely forgot about having to do that is because sometimes you'd say, okay, I want to zip up or rar up whatever it yeah. is my whole audio library yeah. and I want to back it up over all these discs. You can do it where you can say, I want each piece to be less than 700 megs. So it'll fit on that disc. And then yeah. it'll automatically make that mini. I just think it's I'm really so glad we don't that, have to think that way anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's funny that like, I've actually gotten the question of what does burning a CD mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, what does that mean? I'm like, Oh man. Like I, yeah. I pinch myself. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but um yeah yeah and the other aspect of that was also just seeing the cost change i remember um during my one of my deployments in 2004 uh one of my friends paid a hundred dollars for a one gigabyte thumb drive which at that time was like yeah that's a great deal like that's you'll awesome. never need any more yeah yeah <laughs> and that has been incredibly false um and then at one point I remember the standard of metric was like, oh, if you can get a dollar a gig, that's a great deal. So like a hard, yeah. 100 gig hard drive for 100 bucks, that's fantastic. You know, that was like three, four years after that first. Hard it's drive. crazy. Really it third, or, yeah, or it really is drive. insane. I mean, I, I just bought a four terabyte hard drive for 180 bucks. Yeah, I think I got a, uh, what was it? I, I haven't opened it yet, but I was going to be using this for um, to back up some some assets is Western Digital. I think it was yeah, 14 terabyte, and I think it was also about 180 bucks. Now, here's the thing with the 14 terabytes, though. As my friend liked to put it, um, the more you have on it, the more you can lose. <laughs> the more right. you lose all at once. Right. So yeah, you know, it's going to be part that's of actually, my redundancy. That's actually <laughs> really smart. Now that you say that. Yeah. Maybe I should have just bought four one. Oh my God. Now I feel stupid. <laughs> that's, that's actually the perfect way to think about it. Cause you say, sure. I'm going to back up the last year worth of data mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm. going to be almost a terabyte. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's just my stuff sure, was yeah. a, a terabyte and a half for, for a whole year's worth of stuff. So yeah. I'm like, I should have just bought a two terabyte hard drive, throw it on there and then just put it in the closet and not worry about it. That way <laughs> yeah. there's no drive uh, wear or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, I, again, the, there's a balance, man. There's a balance somewhere there, you know, because I think for me, and this is something that I haven't built yet, but I want to, I think the best solution for my personal needs is uh, I want to just build an array, a RAID array, um, and it format it either so that we have the redundancy or even better so that you have the performance and build, you know, do a 10 drive rate array so that you have redundancy and performance and do something insane like that. But that, you know, that takes, that takes cash. So <laughs> a little bit at a time, a little bit of research. And one of the funny things about that is um, as I, as I research and I save up for, you know, the bigger projects like that, uh, the technology advances and suddenly the things I was saving up for have gotten way cheaper, but the things that are now relevant cost about the same of what I've been saving up for anyways. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Okay. I've got, I've got two more questions. The last one's right. ridiculous. I'm just going to tell you right now. It's ridiculous. Okay. But the That's third cool. one, and I'm going to broaden this. All right. Bucho, because you he said, is there a particular filmmaker? But I, I will just say, is there anyone that you, that you admire so much that you would work for them for less than your usual rates? Be careful. <laughs> I understand that there's one of those things where you're like, well, I'm not going to say what I'm worth, but you know what I'm saying. I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's a filmmaker that I would tie my that concept to. I'm a big fan of, of, of uh, directors, of cinematographers, uh, but I think that I would rather um, tie it to maybe a franchise or uh, something like that. Um, for example, for me, my absolutely like, okay, so I have, I have kind of, I, I have two kind of, uh, life goals as far as visual effects right okay long term wise it's not film it's not episodic necessarily i want to do cool stuff that is 
visually stunning, but is useful within the STEM field. So uh, one of the coolest examples is like Cosmos. Cosmos would be my dream job. Anything that brings that actual knowledge and representation of visualizing the real world around us. I, oh man, I absorb that. I love it. Now, on a project or franchise basis, I have been following everything I can about the Borderlands project. I would love to work with Eli Roth and Lionsgate and that whole gang. Um, I have gone as far as, I think I own some uh, both A and B type stock in Lionsgate as well. <laughs> like, it's just, wow. I, I want to, I, I, I'm really passionate about the franchise and the lore. Uh, like Yoshi, I'm really big about the lore uh, of things in general, which is really um, ironic because the first the first title in the in the game uh, in the franchise didn't really have uh, it wasn't very heavy on lore at all. Um, but there is something about what they were doing that really clicked with me and um, that I really enjoyed. And so I've absorbed as much as I can. And I've gotten really deep into other games too. Like I've I've, I've jumped into really really deep into the lore of Skyrim and Fallout and a lot of Bethesda titles as well um things like that but for some reason Borderlands uh as a franchise is it just hits every single button that is appealing to me if that makes sense no that makes perfect sense and I, it kind of I'm almost embarrassed I've never played a Borderlands game don't be embarrassed in fact I am so excited for you because now you get to play for the first time <laughs> you can't you can't replicate that and, now we're uh where should yeah. i where should i play it um it honestly i have it for every system <laughs> since the 360 and ps3 i have it on ps4 i have it on xbox one and the new gen um you, i think it's now available on the switch as well if you yeah. want to play the first one uh is available on the switch uh i recommend maybe starting there the legendary edition was on sale recently which i think had everything except for the uh, Borderlands 3 content. Um, and then Borderlands and is, 3 is separate, right? It's like a separate Yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, that'd be its own thing. But that's like, um, that's uh, Borderlands 1 to um, the pre-sequel, all their DLCs, uh, especially Borderlands 2. The DLCs that they had on there were absolutely fantastic. They're like, they really gave a lot of value for, for what they were. I think. It's funny you say that though, because I'm that way with Diablo, but not oh, in yeah. a lore way, but mm -hmm. I realized when uh because you know they, they just did the diablo 2 resurrection thing yes the yeah. alpha came out yesterday i put my name in i wasn't chosen so whatever <laughs> but anyway i own diablo 3 on mac on pc on <laughs> ps4 on ps or no ps4 and the switch and oh, wow. i've played yeah. i've played and beaten through multiple characters yeah. oh, on all of and, them and steam as well so for for my side of things as well so whatever those yeah, uh, counterparts are available on Steam. Yeah, and I think for me, uh, a part of it was I I enjoyed a certain social aspect of it, um, even though it wasn't always all four people. It was maybe just me and one other friend, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the experience enough that I was like, oh, you have it on that system. I happen to have the system. I will gladly buy this again to play with you. So I'm kind of happy now that they're doing some crossplay stuff. But it was one of those things that just felt worth it, and I. I think um, there are some characters that I didn't actually end up playing through in the first game. And in the second one, I got through almost all of them. Uh, I, I think I, I got through all of them. And in the third one, I think I'm, I'm, I've am i maxed out all of them in different builds at some point or another. Wow. And I haven't, See, I didn't play I, it that much. Yeah, but... I haven't. I, I kind of, um, I'm not really a, a, com a completionist per se, but I do hit things a little hard. Um, <laughs> when I stopped playing Skyrim, I think I was... Well, let's say I played I played Fallout three uh, Fallout four uh, first, um, and I think I got to like level one hundred and two, and then when I played Skyrim, I think I stopped off somewhere in like one hundred and sixteen or something like that. Which I know there's like people yeah. online that go like way up there, but for a casual player, like all my friends were like, "What the?" <laughs> and so I was like, I don't know. I just I I like games that can hook me and then provide me that kind of content and that experience that See, makes it feel like i can explore it and that's what happened with me with breath of the wild i am totally i oh, would consider yeah. me a total casual gamer but mm -hmm. i've put i mean i played through the entire game on stream mm -hmm. i've and i'd played through the whole game all shrines twice before that wow so i've played awesome. i've played through all of it three times 
Wow. And I can see that. I can see why you, I, I played through it. Um, I didn't get through the, the last DLC. Around that time, my wife jumped in. And again, she was much more of a casual gamer as well. Um, and I don't know how, when she had really played like an action kind of game like that. And she just did the same thing. She went and hit every shrine. And I think where she kind of stopped was not, I don't think she was going to go hunt down all of the, uh, the, 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 the seeds. No. Yeah, the seeds. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so, uh, but short of that, yeah, did the same thing, but not multiple times like yourself, but I can see the replayability though. And well, what's, I think what it is, is that was the first game where it was like, you know, you see off in the distance and it was something imagine it, imagination, right? Yes. You go, I want to go see what that is. I can see yes. it from here. What is that? You mark it on your map and you go, all right, let's go. Yeah. And you spend three hours getting there because you get in all these other adventures on along the way, you know, yeah. that's, yeah. I love that. And for some reason, Skyrim, mm -hmm. I, I bought that. I bought that twice, tried mm -hmm. to play it twice. Couldn't get into it. The Witcher, same, same thing. No, no, same. Like the, the first, the first time or two that I tried it for whatever reason, I don't know if it was like I wasn't in the mood for it or something felt weird about it. Um, for me, I I was a little clunky because I was used to like you know fast paced action RPGs, yeah. like, you know God of War and, and things like that. And uh, Dark Siders is one of my other favorite franchises. Oh yeah. Um, if there is a Dark Siders film, I or franchise, I would love to be a part of that too. <laughs> um, but no, uh, yeah, seeing that and. Um, and just uh, being able to kind of, um, what do I say? Um, ah, damn, I, my, my train of thought derails and takes a dirt road, if <laughs> yeah. you will. You're talking um, about like just getting lost in the world? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Um, so I ended up um, playing um, uh, Fallout 4 first. And uh, again, with Skyrim, it felt a little clunky because I was used to the, again, the fast yeah. action RPGs. And when I got so used to fallout and i was like this is amazing i got sucked into the story and all of the side stories and the exploration um, a lot of things that really um, that really clicked for me and then i went back and i tried skyrim again I'm like oh this is basically like a melee build and fallout as far as controls go and so that learning curve was out of the way and then i was able to just enjoy it uh you know for what it had to present but it did take me a couple times for whatever hmm. reason um and then it just, just clicked for you yeah yeah but again it definitely hmm. wasn't the first time for me well but maybe i should I ended up try putting that much time into it what's that i said maybe i should just go ahead and try it again i'm not yeah, sure maybe, oh and by maybe. the way uh i mean you you've you, you were already high on the list of of okay th this guy's top tier but you oh, just you. you said cosmos and oh, yes. dude uh <laughs> And I'm talking Carl Sagan's com Cosmos. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I watch I watch it once a year at least. Oh, once man, a year. That's that's fantastic. I love yeah. love love it. Yeah, watching. Um, books. Yeah, watching uh, watching uh, Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmos, or um, as well as going back and I, I rewatched the uh, the interviews between Bill Moyers and Joseph Campbell. Um, oh yeah, I've seen that too. Those I try to I try to rewatch them. Um, since I think the first time I watched them was was maybe like five four or five years ago and like it has such an impact on me and then life happens and you kind of think you know the lessons learned or the the, the mindfulness that it kind of brought about sometimes it gets a little clouded and fuzzy and like i love to just rewatch it and even if it's just like as i'm falling asleep put it on like a tablet or something and listen to it and um but yeah um those are all just really great just wonderful positive things that yes are awesome yeah and i've got this i've got this theory and it's kind of a big theory, but it's one okay. of those things where like with Cosmos, okay. Cosmos is one of those things where if you, you can watch it and you can mm -hmm. say, yeah, I remember all those things. And a lot of the things are in your head, mm -hmm. but I call them mental shortcuts. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like, I like ice cream. Like if, if you haven't had ice cream in months, you can go, yeah, yeah I, I remember I like ice cream, but sometimes yeah. you need to go back and remember why you like ice cream. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's with Cosmos. It's yeah. I remember a lot of the things he said, but I need to remember why. I yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and 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 sometimes that's a joy in and of itself, you know. Yes. Um, on the flip side, I have a friend of mine who, um, <laughs> she goes. I think there's there's an IHOP near her house that is just really not great, and <laughs> she had lived in the same place for you know almost a decade, and she goes, I avoid it all year, and then once a year, I allow myself to go have some, and then I. 
have the experience that I'm expecting and I remind myself why. She's like, but every year I want to see why was it that I didn't go back there? And she goes there and she's like, I leave full and remembering why I don't want to go back. And I'm like, that's really funny. Like, <laughs> Well, it's all, to me, it's like, the okay, I, I might offend some people, including Jay, uh, but the McRib, I feel like the McRib is that is that yearly reminder of, oh yeah, <laughs> this does suck as bad as I remember. Um, oh man. You candy know, corn was another one. I don't know. But anyway. It's, it's funny, I have mixed feelings about the McRib, and it's it's not because I like the McRib, it's because it reminded me of probably something that wasn't much better, but it was a it was a really good rib sandwich that was on like one of those uh, construction uh, like food trucks years yep. ago. Uh, now see, I get dad. that. Yeah, if there's so a nostalgic like, oh. element to it, I get it. But yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, that reminds me of that thing. Like, right. That's about it. Otherwise, I'm like. It's kind of, to me, it's like a, it's like eating light anything. Sure, sure. You know, I mean, I, I get it. There's people that are trying to watch their weight or, you know, they maybe they have portion control issues or whatever. But uh-huh. I think, no, just eat less of the real thing. But anyway, oh, that's okay. an, that's just another topic. Sure, sure. Food for thought. Yeah, huh? yeah food for thought. <laughs> but, okay, so the last thing, because I've, sure. I've kept you almost three hours now and i oh, i apologize my, my, my classes my classes that i teach every friday are three and a half hours and i'm usually talking most of it i'm having a blast so okay I good okay this, good yeah. okay uh because i what i was thinking was we'd just wrap up with sure. this last question which i said is ridiculous okay have you ever used your powers for evil <laughs> um i i try I try not to. I don't think that there is really an, a situation um, per se, but there was there was one weird situation that I did use it for evil in that um, we were trying to get we were trying to get something exchanged. Uh, I think it was like a, a a print or a poster or something that was like non consequential, and for some reason, the the company who I think it was uh, maybe a lithograph. The company who created it was like, we won't send you another one unless you show us that you've torn the corner off of the original so that I guess I can't resell it or something. And I like we had no intention of reselling it or doing something like on the black market with this thing. Um, I think it was like a poster of Claptrap from like <laughs> from Borderlands um, that someone had made. And I was like, okay, that's really weird, but I really don't want to like, tear this thing up it was like it basically it arrived like just crushed like it had gone through a grinder by the time it got here so i was like hey can you guys like do something about this and they're like again we're not going to give you another one and so i was like until you have to send us a picture showing that you've torn off the edge or something like so i was like all right so i went through and i like i comped a torn edge and i even like i did a video it was like an actual like okay there I, I, you know the thing and i submitted that <laughs> And it was, you know, it was tracked and moved and I had, it was on the carpet on the ground. So I think that was the most evil thing I've done. <laughs> well, I was thinking, well, I, I was thinking of a lot of, like when I read the question, I started thinking of a lot of ways that you really could use visual effects for evil. Yeah, but, yeah. um, but then I was thinking about your memes and I was like, well, he's probably just going to bring up a meme. That's a yeah. funny one though. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I, I think in the long term, trying to, there's a lot of things that can be done, but there's a there's definitely a certain line between entertainment and fraud so <laughs> using it for evil might have legal ramifications depending on how far one goes <laughs> yeah so so I, I even told bucho i was like i was like you know what honestly i think that that's that's a question that i should ask every person yeah from here on out. i like it i Be- think that's a great great question yeah i mean it's a it's a really good one but anyway is there is there anything else you want to you want to wrap up with or or let somebody know about because like i said um in fact here i'm just going to do it again uh oh and by the way this is uh forever um this event in chat if anybody like if two months goes by and they're like who was that guy that was the visual effects guy and i can go oh it's jose and i can just type in exclamation point jose and bam all of your information's there your your Dude. website your linkedin um awesome so yeah go see jose if uh yeah you know more um, about him. I- I, uh, I definitely am doing a lot more um, kind of uh, in the mentorship field these days. Um, I always welcome that. Um, if anybody here is either uh, in, in 
school or an aspiring artist or trying to you know change careers or from one department to another or just wants to like just talk shop or anything like that um definitely check out um i, I do most of my networking through linkedin i think these days um but yeah feel free to send me a message there or, or shoot a request do whatever and um again it's just uh building the community and again i'm always happy to happy to take any kind of questions that i can be of help with and uh I mean, what good's the knowledge if uh, it just helps one person, right? Like, if, if it, it costs me nothing to to pay it forward, so. I'm oh, that's awesome, that. yeah. and uh, and I, very enjoyable show. Come back soon. That's what Eagle Ford said. Um, thank thank you. you again for coming on. Thank you all for watching, and uh, and yeah, I guess uh, I guess cool. we'll see you on the next the the next one. So that sounds great. I look forward to it already. It's right. great talking to you, Rob. All right, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, <laughs> Have a good night.